Good evening, everybody. It's shortly after 6.30 p.m. Uh, today is Monday, April 30th. This is a special meeting of Lakewood City Council. Uh, we have one item on our agenda this evening, which is proposed ordinance 27-18. Uh, as we do with all council meetings, I'd ask that uh, we begin by rising and joining me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Um, as I noted uh, here today at the top of the meeting, um, we do have just the one item uh, on our agenda tonight, which is 27-18, which is an ordinance um, that speaks about the term sheet between uh, Carnegie Development Company and the city of Lakewood and the pr uh, proposed development at the former hospital site, uh, which has become known as One Lakewood Place. Um, before we delve uh, too deeply into our conversation tonight. I wanted to um, begin by acknowledging that we do have a new court filing um, to speak to, and that is that in the case of uh, Edward Graham et al., the city of Lakewood et al., there was uh, a motion filed on Friday for a temporary restraining order um, against the city from demolishing the hospital building itself. Um, Late this afternoon, before the city could file its response, uh, the court granted that motion. Uh, however, for our purposes tonight, I want to note a couple of things. Um, and I, before we, um, again, get too far down the path, I will uh, turn it over to our law director, Kevin Butler, um, to go into a little bit more detail. But I wanted to note that the restraining order um, deals with the demolition of the hospital building itself, and in fact, explicitly addresses that council is not restrained from continuing to deliberate on the matter, nor from voting on the ordinance that's before us this evening. So for those reasons, uh, obviously we're going to continue to go ahead and meet tonight, uh, as we have in previous weeks, uh, to continue to discuss. And um, I want to note as well that uh, with respect to this temporary restraining order, I think we as council members, owe it to ourselves, and I think as council members, we owe it to our constituents and the city that we represent to continue to deliberate meaningfully on the document that's in front of us tonight. I think that, uh, as we all know, the citizens of the city of Lakewood have voted multiple times to affirm uh, both the master agreement uh, as well as the city's decision to move forward uh, and re-envision the hospital site. So in light of uh, those facts and the fact that, as we've discussed, the time sensitivity of certain opportunities facing the city with this development is acute, I think uh, we're best served by continuing our deliberations in earnest. And uh, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Butler for uh, additional discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> um, I explained in uh, some communication to you earlier uh, today, council members, that we received this order uh, late today. I won't go into the substance of that communication, but I will tell you that the order uh, uh, prevents the city from taking any action, quote, that would raise Lakewood Hospital, end quote. Um, until further order of court. City has filed its brief in opposition uh, as of today, and we expect to file uh, additional documents as, the, uh, uh, as are necessary uh, in the future. And we will continue to point out uh, that the master agreement calls for the demolition or redevelopment of the hospital site, that that master agreement um, was adopted unanimously by City Council in December of 2015, and has since been affirmed by a direct vote of the people of Lakewood. Um, and so um, uh, I will just tell you that I would agree with the council president that council should continue its deliberations um, and will sort out this uh, temporary order uh, prohibiting the city from raising Lakewood Hospital in court. Um, I can tell you that the order, in my view, uh, does not address any 
or doesn't enjoin any acute developments at the hospital site uh, or imminent developments at the hospital site. I believe the court was mid-less, uh, mid-led, misled, excuse me, into believing that the hospital could be demolished tomorrow if council took a vote tonight. That's uh, certainly not the case, and anyone who's been attending these meetings would know that. The, de the demolition of the hospital wouldn't occur in earnest until at least September of 2018 um, with a, uh, abatement inside the building, and then um, uh, the actual demolition in earnest wouldn't occur until at least December of 2018. And so this is not a situation that is going to negatively impact our ability to continue these discussions. I want you to be aware of that. Uh, as you move forward with the with the deliberations. Thank you. Um, I want to note uh, I am remiss at this point um, in not acknowledging everyone who's here tonight. Uh, first of all, of course, our audience members, thank you again for attending. Um, this is, uh, as I've mentioned, um, not the not the first meeting uh, on this topic, to be sure, um, but just uh, as a refresher, we'll go around. Uh, we have Mr. George Papandreas from Carnegie Development um, to my right, uh, as well as Mr. Rustam Corey III. Uh, we have Robin Mentor Smyers uh, from Thompson Hine, uh, who's representing the city with respect to our development agreement negotiations. Uh, we have Mr. Rob Cahill, uh, who's a relatively newer face um, for some. He is our outside counsel uh, representing the city on the um, Edward Graham et al. matter. Um, then we have, of course, Kevin Butler, Mayor Summers, our finance director, Jen Pei, our uh, planning and development director, Bryce Sylvester, and Tracy Nichol, uh, Nichols, again, uh, is joining us from PMC um, to give us uh, her uh, expertise as far as um, the overall structure and evaluation of uh, the development agreement and financials. So. Um, Introductions dispensed with. Uh, I would like to, at this point, um, I guess, uh, refer back to Law Director Butler. Um, Law Director, is there any um, additional information or update um, that Council um, should be aware of with respect to um, the restraining order and uh, going forward um, when Council might expect uh, a more definitive ruling on that or? Um. Uh, at this point, we it'd be very hard to say, but I suspect that there will be additional um, activity in the case uh, within the next couple of weeks. Thanks. So I hope to provide you a clearer update uh, shortly. Thank you. Um, I also wanted to provide uh, Mayor Summers an opportunity um, to speak to these developments. Thank you, uh, Council President O'Leary, members of Council, members of the audience. Uh, uh, personally, I'm not surprised uh, that such an action would be taken. Uh, what I am disappointed in, though, is that uh, the court was misled. Uh, I look forward to our attorneys. Uh, excuse me. Can we uh, all be respectful? Thank you. The court you. was misled in terms of the sense of imminency of this action. I think uh, as... as uh, Council President mentioned those who have been paying attention to this process, which has gone on for several, well, really uh, about a year and a half in the, in the redevelopment process, know that uh, there's a very deliberative multi-step process. Those, pro those steps are before us. The demolition process for anything in this community has uh, many aspects to it, and most of those aspects have not even begun. And they will take months to actually uh, execute them. Uh, so that's all before us. Uh, so the question, too, is uh, the expectation determined by the citizens of Lakewood uh, with what their future is in its development. And they have thought through, spoken, and listened and decided, and we have an obligation to honor that will. And uh, the courts can be used uh, as, 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 as a, appropriately or inappropriately as we may be experiencing here, in my opinion. Uh, but the fact of the matter is I feel obligated to press forward and honor that will that was clearly spoken, and I intend to do so. Thank you. Uh, I will now um, open the floor uh, to council members if there are any questions at this time. Um, again, I would like to focus kind of on the uh, preliminary legal developments of the day uh, at this time, uh, after which we'll move on uh, to the bulk of the meeting, which is, uh, again, a continuation of our substantive discussion of uh, the term sheet. Yes, Mr. Councilman Mayor. George. Thank you. Um, I, I have a couple questions related to the to the filing. 
um, one for, for the Carnegie management team, a couple for the administration. First, um, Mayor, you state that uh, the court was misled. Um, why, why do you feel that the court was misled? You know, and, and understanding the timeline that we need to get this passed so we can have construction in September, um, why is it your opinion that the, the court was misled? Well, as, as you well know, Councilman, that we have a long process ahead regarding the demolition. It's not going to happen next week, the week after, or the month after. In fact, Council will have to weigh in on the significant aspects of appropriation, of uh, contract authority, and ultimately an RFQ process. That'll be many, many months that are before us. So the idea that the court felt compelled to take uh, uh, its, its action based on what it thought was an imminent threat, I think, is, is, is an error. And I, I look forward to having a chance for us to tell that story to the court, and I'm sure they'll be very interested to hear it. Okay. Um, I, I don't happen to agree with your opinion on that, but um, you know, you're, enti you're entitled to your, your opinion. Um, moving a bit on to how, how does this impact, I guess, to the Carnegie team, how does this impact the development, if at all, um, knowing that this uh, temporary restraining order was granted um, and signed off on um, by three, uh, three presiding judges? How does that impact the deal? Uh, Councilman George, we at this juncture do not see that it has any imminent threat to the project. Uh, our key, our key from our key is what's most important is the schedule that we've identified and set forth initially. And in, so long as that is kept on track, then there is no uh, imminent threat to the project. So if this were to go uh, on for a bit within the Court of Appeals, um, and, and delay the project, then it could potentially impact what's on the table? If right now we have a tentative schedule, as I understand it, where demolition would occur, there's a remediation that could be ongoing on portions of the building, uh, but the idea is that uh, demolition would occur sometime in September with a potential turnover of the pad ready for construction in the first quarter of 2019. It is that key milestone date that is critical to us. We have obligations that we're now entering into with prospective tenants that uh, obligate us and bind us to certain dates, and we will need to know soon that those dates are going to be met. But until that point of time is, occurs, uh, there is no risk as we see it. Okay, thank you. And then just, just one more, because I want to obviously turn it over to my colleagues. Just in the, in the case of this delaying um, the, the demolition that's uh, for September, is the city analyzing, um, you know, what sort of carrying costs there may be for holding the site and keeping it, um, you know, monitoring the site? What kind of carrying costs would there be? We have identified the categories of those costs. Um, they would include insurance for liability. It would include security. It would include... Um, probably basic maintenance to make sure it was not unsafe to anyone around it or inside it. Uh, and uh, the, if there's utilities involved to keep things from uh, destroying themselves uh, in, in, in some sort of delay would be borne by the taxpayers of Lakewood. So there are significant costs and risks. A uh, big empty building in the middle of our town creates an enormous risk in my opinion. It becomes an attractive nuisance. It'll be very difficult to make sure that uh, someone doesn't enter it uh, inappropriately or illegally, and uh, that will be our responsibility to make sure that doesn't happen. So uh, we have to be very clear that there are the, the costs of doing nothing but holding that building are, are, are noteworthy. Well, I, we'll be able to quantify that as we go on, um, but, um, but let's not delude ourselves to thinking they, they won't be reasonably high, and they are in those categories. It is a 400,000 square foot building. It will not be inexpensive. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see when you have those uh, numbers put together, um, I'd like to see what we're looking at for carrying costs when you have those. But I would ask you then, what do you think is a reasonable cost? To me, that's a cost that goes nowhere. Uh, it, uh, to, to have any cost that uh, basically takes us sidewards is something that would be a misdirection of taxpayer dollars, in my opinion. We're working hard to make sure we manage those dollars well here. That's a big, important understanding in terms of sound governance. We have plans that do acknowledge them, address them, and 
turn those uh, resources into actually tax yielding dollars uh, as much in, and certainly in terms of property tax that have never been forthcoming from that property. That's part of our responsibility as well today. So uh, it's one thing to, uh, to, uh, to take uh, uh, no action. It's another one to take a positive action that, it, that advances the quality of life of our citizens and lessens the ultimate tax burden that they pay by sharing it over a, a wider economic base. That's our goal here as well. I hope it's yours as well. Thank you. And I, I would note, too, that I, I do think those are, are fair questions. As we um, put finer points to some of the numbers that may be involved in a carrying cost, I think it would be irresponsible to go down that path and not have an idea of what is a reasonable threshold for that carrying cost, or frankly, why that would make sense. Uh, and, you know, again, with those numbers uh, as to carrying cost, I think that it's also significant that as the mayor mentioned, it's not just the actual cost of maintaining the building itself, it's the fact that the city's would-be investment in this project, which would be amortized within a four to five year period, is then going to not be coming into city coffers within that time frame. And so I think that um, any carrying cost numbers would potentially appropriately separately reflect the fact that there's a, an enormous opportunity cost to the city continuing to carry that property, uh, particularly if there's no purpose for doing so. Um, any other questions or comments? Yes, Councilman Rader. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, yeah, I, I guess there is some flexibility when we can demolish the hospital, right? I mean, I was told today that it was going to be demolished in December and August and in September, September, August and December. So there's some flexibility there. I mean. Yeah, the key, the key, um, Councilman Rader, again, is I'll, and I'll emphasize this, is that we received that pad by in spring of 2019. That okay. is the drop dead date for us. Otherwise, it definitely does impact the project and it does place it at risk. So Thank whatever you. is required in order to get to that point from a time critical path point of view, um, you know, you need to back up from that point. Okay. Thank you. And uh, so. I guess what this tells me today, the thought that I have on uh, on this uh, motion being granted, is that the the court is it seems to me, and some of the lawyers I talked to at the firm where I work, and some other people, that that the court is taking this pretty seriously, and um, I'm not as sure as some people maybe that this is going to be just dismissed. Uh, there may be some I don't know. I'm not a judge. You know, we're the legislators. They're the judge. They have to make that decision. We can't. But, I mean, I think it's at least worth noting here in a public forum that, you know, maybe this won't be dismissed. And what happens if certain portions of it aren't dismissed? I know this is actually a conversation uh, Law Director Butler and I did have, and uh, I would like to hear from the Law Director and maybe the Mayor or even uh, you, uh, uh, George, about um, what happens if this doesn't get, this doesn't get dismissed? And what if portions of it are actually uh, upheld or overturned, I should say? Law Director Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilman Rader, um, really it's inappropriate for us to talk about the strategy on whether or not the appeal um, affirms the trial court's decision or in some way or another might overturn it. Um, I mean, we can deal with that um, as the appeal progresses, but um, um, it, certainly not uh, advisable for any attorney to advise his client in an open meeting on that sort of strategy. Um, what I can tell you is that um, at this point, the only uh, issue that is before us right now is this temporary order temporarily preventing the city from demolishing the property until the court <coughs> hears the arguments from all sides. That's really what's before us. And we are not inclined to discuss the merits of the appeal, certainly not in an open forum. I'd be happy to have a meeting with council anytime you wish to discuss uh, you know, that litigation update. Okay, thank you. And I'll yeah, just add that if Councilman Rader, um, if you'd like to have that conversation and go into executive session for that purpose, um, you're obviously more than welcome to make the motion and I think it would be um, received well by council if, if you feel um, that that's an important consideration for um, you, then, you know, we can um, endeavor to answer that question in executive session. Uh, would it be appropriate to uh, do that next meeting, perhaps? Let me think about it. And is that a time that we could, or Mr. President, what do you think about timing, if that were something that 
I feel or others feel would should happen. What do you think? I think that we could probably um, schedule an executive session for Monday, uh, the seventh. I, I I'm also looking to our attorneys to um, make sure availability is such that they can be present. Okay. Um, Thank you. Sure. Council President Leary. Yes. I'd, I'd like Mayor to make a, make a point here. I think what's unsaid is that there's an expectation that there is an alternative use of this land. I'd like to know what it is. If there is a credible alternative to happen to the building as it sits, I think the citizens of Lakewood should hear what that is. But the idea of putting these forces of obstruction and delay in the middle in the absence of an alternative is unacceptable to our citizens and I think to our responsibility as leaders here. The fact of the matter is the building sits there. We do own it. It is empty. It is old. Uh, it is, uh, has been vacated for its primary use. The, the inference must be that someone would open a hospital on that site. If that is the case, I would like to know who that might be. And I would like our citizens to entertain that option if it's there. But we have never heard such an option in three years of consideration here. And I think it's time that we, uh, we have to understand what that option is. Um, Thank you. I I would tend to agree with those comments, and I, I think that it is important for Council, um, as we move forward uh, with our considerations, to remain, as you say, um, cognizant of the fact that we're not um, considering this site in a vacuum. Uh, we're considering a term sheet proposing a specific development agreement, um, and we're also, um, you know, proposing looking at this within the context of our recent history and uh, the knowledge that, and experience that that's given us with, with respect to the site, with the interest that's in the site, and, and possible um, future uses of the site. So um, I do appreciate those comments. Uh, any other comments from Council before we um, Mr. President. get to the substance of uh, tonight? Yes, Councilman Anderson. I was hoping that the uh, law director would be able to give us a, just a, a quick snapshot of the original Graham versus Madigan Graham versus Lakewood um, filing from a couple of years ago, which was uh, ruled against originally, and now it's under appeal. And the way I see this current ruling is, is basically just trying to protect the appeal process, but the, the original is under appeal, and it was originally ruled in the city's favor. Am I correct in all that? Yeah. Law Director Butler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The original, uh, the original lawsuit was uh, filed in 2015 as city council was considering uh, the proposed term sheet, for lack of a better word, uh, uh, between LHA and the Cleveland Clinic and Lakewood Hospital Foundation uh, for uh, the closure of the hospital and the opening of a family health center. Uh, City Council received that proposal, began deliberating on it, and five taxpayers demanded that uh, Council cease its deliberations. When Council did not do that, um, the, those five taxpayers uh, filed a lawsuit to try to prevent City Council from continuing its deliberations, and also to try to prevent the closure, the ultimate closure of Lakewood Hospital. Uh, within that complaint, uh, there were a whole bunch of different claims uh, made against the city. Those five taxpayers claimed to represent all the citizens of Lakewood. Um, the trial judge, um, uh, we, we briefed all the issues uh, in the complaint and uh, the trial judge ultimately dismissed the entirety of the complaint. Um, uh, and in his well-reasoned order, uh, indicated that these taxpayers do not have the right to stand in the place of Lakewood's citizens, or Lakewood's elected officials, I should say, um, to make these claims. Uh, so the case was outright dismissed, um, and these five uh, individuals have now appealed to the Eighth District Court of Appeals. Um, and we await uh, uh, a ruling from the 8th District on, their, on the substance of their appeal. Meanwhile, this motion was filed late last week, um, and that's what we've been discussing tonight. The entirety of the appeal was dismissed? Originally. The entirety of the original complaint was dismissed, yes. That's Thank correct. You. Every claim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman O'Malley. Just uh, <clears throat> to quickly reiterate or, or note how 
this impacts us as city council, Director Butler. It doesn't prevent city council from deliberating or voting, but also they, the appellants weren't even seeking to prevent us from, from voting. Is that correct? I'd say fairly that's correct. Uh, both of those statements are correct. Okay. Thank the, you. The court has not uh, enjoined or, or prohibited city council from continuing its deliberations and ultimate vote. Sir, uh, can you speak up? I think the microphone's muffled. Yeah. Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Um, the court has neither pro prohibited city council from, uh, I should say, neither has the court pro prohibited city council from continuing its deliberations and voting on the ordinance that's before you. Um, the court was not asked uh, to do so, that's correct. So the plaintiffs in this case uh, did not seek to enjoin these deliberations. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. President. Uh, yes, Councilman. <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. Nice to see so many Lakewood neighbors here once again. It's like a reunion. Um, the couple questions or a couple clarifying points. So first of all, uh, to speak to Councilwoman George's point about whether, uh, and the Mayor's point, discussion about whether the imminency and the urgency is there or not and why the court would grant it. Now, um, for the attorneys in the room, we, we, the motion requested two things. One is a temporary restraining order. Two is a preliminary injunction, correct? Preliminary injunction would take a little bit longer to grant, to deliberate upon, and for the judge to make a ruling, it, as I understand it. Dr. Butler, Butler. That's correct, Councilman. And that preliminary injunction may still be, that, that request may still be heard. Oh, absolutely. In fact, the, the court specifically days. indicates that this order only lasts for as long as the court hasn't ruled on the uh, motion for preliminary injunction. Which was held the in court advance. court has not yeah. ruled on that, and I suspect the court is going to be uh, open to being educated on uh, all the issues raised so in the original motion. So the, the, the point I'm driving at is there's two, there's two tools in this toolbox here. One is immediate, urgent, that's called the temporary restraining order, and uh, the more robust deliberation where both parties get to speak would be the preliminary injunction request, hearing, and decision. And so typically a court wouldn't grant or consider or order a temporary restraining order unless there is an urgency, correct? Because it's a one-sided kind of affair. Uh, Director Butler? I'd say typically that's correct. Okay. So I think that the, the tenor of what the mayor is, is describing is if the court used an emergency, very fast timeline legal tool called a temporary restraining order, the court would have been under the impression that within hours or days, demolition was a possible fact. And since that's not, nobody's considering that, that seems to be a misimpression by the court, in which case the court could have skipped the temporary restraining order and just scheduled the hearings for the preliminary injunction, which is a, likely to happen anyway. So, um, so whether, whether you believe that the court was misled or just the court was under a misimpression, uh, I'll leave to others. Um, the, <clears throat> the point I think that it's behind, or perhaps maybe behind this legal action, is that if the building is saved, perhaps the hospital could be saved. And I think that's a mistaken impression. The building is not the hospital. A hospital is a business. It's the medical staff. It's the patients. It's the market share. It's the expertise. It's the licensure. It's the equipment. The building is one part of that story. But as a matter of fact, uh, part of the discussion throughout the years was that the Lakewood Hospital building was old, more expensive to maintain, and too big. And how do we know that? We know that because every new hospital being built is about half the number of beds. You go out to Avon, the new facility built by the clinic, and I, probably there are other examples too, instead of 350 plus beds that Lakewood Hospital had, you're down around 200 beds. Um, and uh, it's, it's a more affordable structure since it's new. And so I don't know that saving the old Lakewood Hospital building would contribute at all to 
uh, even anybody who thought that the market in Northeast Ohio might be able to support and afford another hospital business. Um, so as a matter of fact, anybody who wants to create a new hospital uh, in Lakewood might be better served by having a green field or a, a, a blank uh, area. So I think that we're being invited to um, reconsider all of 2015 and 2016 uh, in, in this um, re-litigation of the case, literally. Um, what's important is the notion of opportunity cost and what opportunities can come to a community through a business um, perspective, whether you're talking about a healthcare business or a mixed-use development or something else. And we are considering a real actual proposal, whereas we don't have uh, that in, in fact, maybe the planning de department could uh, remind us what the nine proposed development applications to the city, what, what the spectrum of proposed uses were. Were any of those a hospital uh, or were any of those some other use that might be fitting to that parcel? Uh, and I think we know the answer. The answer is no. Um, and that the market has already spoken on these questions more than once. More than once. Because the market spoke during the hospital board's strategic evaluation, during city council's evaluation of the hospital board's recommendation, and now in 2017 during the uh, request for proposals from private developers. So it's not an unknown about whether an inpatient hospital in this very competitive Northeast Ohio overbedded market is going to be proposed by any realistic player. We know that answer. Uh, and in addition, if, if, um, if there's a player that wants to come forward, they still could. They still could. But I don't think they exist. And um, um, excuse me. Thanks. And therefore, um, it would be irresponsible. It would be a lost opportunity for the city to not pursue other development that will revitalize the downtown, grow the tax base, send a market signal of confidence to the surrounding commercial markets, uh, continue to raise property values and standards for uh, commercial real estate and office uh, in the downtown. Uh, there's many, many, many benefits, uh, all, by the way, uh, not subsidized by the taxpayer which is frankly unheard of um, and uh, a wonderful choice for the community to consider. So I look forward to the balance of the meeting on the merits of the term sheet that's proposed to us tonight. Thank you. Um, at this time, we do have uh, a number of folks uh, signed in to comment on our docket items. Um, I would pose the question to council. Uh, we also have public comment, which we'll take um, at the end of the meeting. Um, but in the meantime, I did want to um, raise the issue to council as to when in this meeting we'd like to uh, take public comment. Um, I think that now might be as good a time as any, um, and I'm seeing general agreement with that, so we'll go ahead and jump into uh, our public comment this evening. We have um, five folks, it looks like so far, that are signed up to speak uh, as to the docket item. Um, and Mr. Dean Dilzell is signed up to speak. Mr. Dilzell. Hello, my name is Dean Dilzell. I live at 1276 French Avenue. And I want you to know, I came here tonight with the idea to discuss, to deliberate about the development project. Matter of fact, I did not find out about the ruling in the court until about an hour before I got here. So it's interesting that we've just spent 
45 minutes deliberating about the court ruling and how it might impact the development when all has been said is that developer says it doesn't cause a problem yet, you're able to vote. But I do want to make uh, some comments, uh, in particular, the issue of misleading. Um, if I go back in history, um, there were a couple of individuals that are here in this room today who actually set about to create an empty hospital building in our city and went to great lengths to do so. I also want to point out that they did that by saying the hospital was losing money, when in fact, right up to the last minute, that was not necessarily the case, particularly if you account for the administrative. Mr. Piece. Giselle, I, I do understand that City Council spent a decent amount of time tonight discussing the legal oh. developments of the day today. Excuse I me. Would like, I would like you, if possible, to keep your comments focused on Ordinance 18, I'm sorry, 27-18, which is the ordinance on the term sheet before us tonight. Thanks. Mr. Chair, Mr. I would like to hear what um, Mr. M Dean would like to say. Uh, as a member of council, I would like to hear what he has to say related to this entire process. I'd like to hear him out. Ms. George, I understand that. And as I was just saying, we'll now hear the remainder of his comments, hopefully focused on Ordinance 27-18. But again, I would note, uh, and I know that you don't have the benefit of having been on council during that period of time, but we do uh, have a huge volume of public comment already on file and before us in terms of our deliberations over that particular issue. And all I'm trying to do, and I think that other uh, council members um, are of a like mind here as well, that we need to use our time efficiently. And that's all. Mr. Dizel. And I'd like to use my time efficiently. If you don't mind, I'd like you to put back a minute and 30 seconds on my speaking time. Mr. Dizel, please continue. Yeah. This is your opportunity to be heard. This it's is my opportunity to be heard while you're talking. Uh, excuse me, but I'm not sure how that works out. So let's go back to misleading. This particular project was advertised as being 120 million investment in our city. I note at the top of this, or the second page of the letter that was signed by Mayor Summers, Sam O'Leary, and Bryce Sylvester, that this project is now worth only an estimated 72 million. Some of these issues had to do with how the voting in this town occurred. And I will remind you that it was rather close, 48 and a half to 51 and a half percent. So that's not an overwhelming mandate to go ahead and do what you would like to do. Some of the issues I had with the project include, we're talking about a hospital we own. To this point, it's been two years. I don't know. Um, is it? Can you, Mary, can you pause the? Now, I, okay. I won't touch it. Sorry about that. So it's been two, two years since the hospital has been closed, and as far as I know, we still don't know how much that hospital is worth, either as an empty building or as a hospital. Key points about the development project. <clears throat> Let me ask, and the, the FAQs that have been circulated widely Answers three, six, and some others have um, information about the return on investment. I'm sorry I missed the meeting last week, but I was out of town. But somehow there's some really interesting math being done. First of all, we leave out the $7 million that the city is using to create the level pad for the developer and the return on investment. And by my calculations, there's only about $486,000 a year that returns to the city. And even if we only use the $6 million investment, that's well over 12 years till there's a return on our investment as a city. I want to ask you, the developer shall strive to include at least 15 units for sale. How legally binding is the word strive? I've got some issues about the estimates of how much this will cost. In addition, there's been a statement that will be 140 units if I'm reading this right, it says 140 units or 100,000 square feet, whichever is less. 
in my estimation, a minimum of 160,000 square feet might be developed for 72 million. That works out to be $450 per square foot. I'm afraid I couldn't find anything that was built for that kind of money anywhere in Ohio. So that's an interesting cost for developing our site. And by the way, I was not the first one to sign up. I'm not sure why you skipped me. I was lower down on the list. We've got several sheets here. Um, all right. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Edward Graham. Edward Graham, 1286 Chase Avenue. <clears throat> now there's uh, <clears throat> the issues of the, the motion that was filed with the Court of Appeals and the mayor said there were misrepresentations. I signed the affidavit and mayor, I tell the truth. I can't say the same for you. Mr. President, can you remind the citizen to not make personal comments, please? You are supposed to direct your comments right. to the chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Graham. Uh, you are not the person presiding at the meeting, meeting Bullock, the chairman. I'm sorry. I, if, we could, if we could just counsel, get back. If he's got something to say, he's the one to say it, not you. Point of order, Mr. Mr. Chair. I, excuse me, Mr. Right. Bullock. I, if we could just get back to Mr. Graham's comments, please. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> One of the things <clears throat> I think is important for this committee, this council to know is that the principal in this, George Papandreas, I'm sure the city administration hasn't brought this fact to your attention, but the city Mr. of Mr. Graham, you, you are, as I, as now I do have to remind you to direct your, your comments to the chair and, and to avoid personalities. I'm directing them to city council. Now, the city council probably hasn't been aware of, made aware of this fact, but the city of Beechwood, Ohio, presently has a lawsuit against George J. Papandreas and a corporation that he formed for failing to turn over income tax that they collected from employees for the years 2012, 2013, and 2014. This is a very important matter. I see the words uh, <clears throat> in, in the 11-page uh, Exhibit one talking about due diligence. I would think that knowing who you're dealing with and their reliability is an important factor and for this city council to be run head first into a deal with somebody who from the year 2012, 2013, and 2014 has been alleged by the city of Beach where they haven't paid the income tax. <clears throat> so that is one of the very important factors to be taken into account. The most important thing, I think, though, is for you to look at the Ordinance 27-18 itself. This is misleading. Section 1 talks about a non-binding term sheet. Go to paragraph 2, section 2. And it says that the mayor and the directors are hereby authorized and directed to execute such other related and ancillary document, including a development agreement, instruments of conveyance, and those documents relating closely to this matter. If you were to pass this, you are giving carte blanche authority for the administration to enter an agreement without your even being consulted. Paragraph three 
all provisions of chapters 111 and 155 <clears throat> are deemed to have been met or superseded by this ordinance. How could this city council deem any ordinance to have been met when they haven't even seen the documents that this would relate to? This is nothing but chutzpah. It's, a, it's an example of not having dual city government with a council and a mayor. The administration is basically saying, be suckers, pass this, and let us do all the deciding. This is not a frivolous matter that I'm talking about. This is, are you doing your sworn job, which is to evaluate intelligently everything that comes ahead of you and that you should be voting on. That is your duty, that's your sworn duty. So for those reasons, and there are many more that I don't have time to in five minutes to mention, you should be voting against such a thing. The Thank second you. and third, the second and third sections should be wiped out of that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, I would just uh, note, um, with respect to the insinuation that, that it's some kind of carte blanche authority, I think that council uh, is going to have um, some additional discussions probably tonight um, with respect to that very question of um, approval of the, the term sheet and the development agreement jointly, separately, et cetera. However, um, I just wanted to note that this is far from uh, an unheard of or unprecedented concept in the city of Lakewood. Um, in fact, the Rockport development, uh, which came through under Mayor George's administration, had exactly the same procedure. Uh, there was a term sheet that was approved by council, and it was authorized to be a development agreement um, in substantially the same form, and that's uh, ultimately um, how that process played out. I do also want to give, uh, in fairness, Mr. Papandreas an opportunity to respond uh, to the comments if he so chooses. Uh, if not, we will move on. Thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, the allegations of impropriety associated with income tax, associated with a corporation of which I was a statutory agent and a minority shareholder being uh, attributed to me personally are incorrect. I just want to go on the record for that. Thank you. Mr. Uh, President, can I just comment on your comment? Sure, Councilman George. I just want to remind uh, everyone that the Rockport development under the George administration, the major difference here is that that was not public land. That, that's a big difference. We're talking about public land as opposed to a private development. So I, I'd like to point out to that difference. I understand that, but I think that the more salient difference is that while it wasn't public land, there were public funds. So it was, there were public dollars that were invested in that project, just as the public is making an investment in this project through the land. And so I would say that they're actually far more similar than different. Our next commenter signed up to speak is Steve Skanzos. Uh, hi, Council. Uh, I had no idea that this uh, temporary restraining order was coming into effect, so I was coming just to speak on what I saw from last week's meeting, which was uh, pretty much geared towards the term sheet and um, about the project and to basically see how um, the council would decide on having some type of agreement so that the developer could have something to show a possible investor um, to kind of get a good hold on who could who could want to be involved with making Lakewood a great city on top of how great it already is now. Um, I'm not going to comment on any type of lawsuits or anything like that because I'm not educated enough in that matter to make those assumptions or whatever. I, I'm here just to talk about what I feel um, I observed in last week's meeting. Um, I feel that this project um, has a lot of potential as far as good, good jobs, 
um, making this this city have some retailers that keep our residents in town more than us trying to go to a couple big box stores, maybe just in other cities like Westlake and, and along those lines. Um, I feel that the project has uh, some really great potential to have um, a contractor, I believe Turner Construction is gonna do it, who recently just did the high school, and uh, I think they did a fantastic job on the high school. Um, I am in the construction trades, and I am fortunate enough to actually have worked on a Turner job before, and it's fantastic. I mean, they're gonna give you a great product. Um, I believe that uh, it's common sense to me as far as um, the way they have the agreement, if we go through and we read and we focus on the problems of today as opposed to focusing on some uh, important details, but details that are meant for maybe other meetings as far as planning commission and architectural review board, which myself I've been in front of because doing certain type of uh, improvements towards property that either myself or my family owns. So I, I think the gist I get of it is that the developer wants to get a basic agreement to sell the project to potential investors for retailers. And I, I, I'm, I'm very happy that people are passionate and they, you know, they wanna make sure everything is, is, is getting um, thoroughly looked at and the best interest of everybody. But the agreement from what I hear is they just want something very basic that says, we're gonna have roughly this amount of commercial storefront space, we're gonna have roughly this amount of residences associated with this project. Are you willing to invest? And what are our options to bring on the table? And that's what I perceived from last week's meeting. So I, I don't see why we should focus on certain uh, aesthetic details until the time is necessary to focus on those aesthetic details. Um, now, like I said, I, I, I'm not gonna talk on the lawsuit. That's, that's something, that's a whole nother animal and I, I don't wanna get tangled up in talking about something that I, I don't have enough information on. So that's just my point. So, I mean, I, I hope a decision can be made and I feel that um, as a collective, the right decision will be made and uh, I'm looking forward to see what happens. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ian Andrews. And just as a housekeeping matter, fortunately, um, everyone who signed up so far wrote their address down, but if you could, um, your name and address uh, for the record. Thanks. Thank you, Councilman. Ian Andrews, 14701 Detroit Avenue. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm the executive director at Lakewood Alive. Uh, and <clears throat> I did not know anything about the lawsuit because I've been down in the basement of our building the entire day. It's like we don't even get the internet down there. So I had no idea until uh, I got here. So I'm here to talk uh, specifically about the project. I'm going to lay out, not as an advertisement, but what we do and then how it relates to the things that I think we could look uh, to as a potential partnership and how we can be uh, a part of making sure this is a great project. We're e eager to help in the extensive and multifaceted process of this downtown liquid redevelopment project. We're a comprehensive nonprofit community development organization whose mission is to foster and sustain vibrant neighborhoods. On the commercial side, we administer the Downtown Lakewood Main Street program, which includes putting on large-scale events like the Meltdown, Spooky Pooch, Light Up Lakewood, Front Porch, drawing 50,000 people annually, supporting local merchants through the Downtown Lakewood Business Alliance and the City Storm for Innovation program, improving the aesthetic appeal of the district like our Blossom Flower program and the soon-to-be-installed Public Art Corner. We're putting in a mural tomorrow. It's pretty exciting. And working to connect businesses to resources while filling vacant spaces. On the housing side, our goal is to ensure everyone in Lakewood lives in healthy and safe housing. We educate folks about how to sustain their old Lakewood home through their Knowing Your Home series, connecting people to resources, working with low to moderate income residents, mostly seniors, to ensure they're living in healthy and safe conditions and running dozens of volunteer projects, including some this week, that bring homes into code compliance while stabilizing entire blocks and being the go-to resource in Lakewood for all things housing. We're also the fiscal agent for two additional merchant associations, Uptown and West End. And lastly, we host community forums talking about the issues of the day. So in this scope, we feel that we're, we are well positioned to be a partner in this redevelopment project by developing a constructive dialogue around design elements, how the space interacts with the rest of the neighborhood and the overall site plan, 
ensuring the historic integrity of the Curtis Block as a vibrant mixed-use building, advocating for local retail and local restaurants to support a diverse commercial tenant mix with the parameters of a competitive, within the parameters of a competitive retail market, providing discussion regarding residential units to maximize space, conditions of the market, and the need for diverse housing options, supporting and if needed, facilitating community dialogue and conversations with merchants, neighbors, and the entire community about any and all aspects of the plan, aiding in the discussion and development of the public space that will be a cornerstone of this development, integrating the new parking garage into the overall downtown Lakewood parking setup to support businesses and residents within and outside of the new development. Uh, and one point that I meant to type up uh, that I just failed to, there's also a huge opportunity on the, um, on the office piece. We are lacking in that Class A office space that I hear people seeking and looking for. There are folks uh, who have left our community looking for different types of office space, and so we have lost some of those jobs. I think this is an opportunity to hopefully regain some of them, not from those companies, but from others. So we look forward to being a positive, productive partner in the process. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker signed up is Dave Wondolowski. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Dave Wondolowski, 3250 Euclid Avenue. Cleveland. Here again, uh, as I was last week, to talk about this project. And um, as a former councilman, I, I certainly can appreciate the opposition here. Um, I, I, I do appreciate their, their activism and their care for their community. But I have seen this before. And I've seen developers, just like the one you have in front of you today, come into communities and offer to build a nice project, a beautiful project that's going to improve the landscape of your community and, and, and improve your, li your livelihoods. And I've seen councils deliberate and deliberate and deliberate more. And I've seen the developer walk away because every day that he's here, while you're deliberating, money gets more expensive, labor goes up, material goes up. Material, I don't know if you're aware, material in construction, concrete and lumber prices and steel prices have risen drastically. I mean, this is serious. And, and, and not only that, they can't lock down financing until they get some approval from you. We, as the building trades, are looking to invest in this project. Equity, cash, uh, as an equity stake. And, it, and it's an exciting time for us. This is an exciting project for us. I hope that the vote will go as scheduled next week. Again, I do appreciate the concern from the residents. I believe you've had a ballot issue on this and the people have spoken. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you and have a nice night. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Captain Steve Eggert, or Egert. is certainly very interesting, very interesting from all sides. I'm Captain Steve Eggert, 902 Beach Road, here in Lakewood. Alternative, you ask, the brazen audacity to say alternative, you ask, the brazen audacity. I've got a 34-page proposal at my house, and there are copies all over the place, of Metro Health System offering at least once to operate full-service Lakewood Hospital for 10 years and $100 million on top of that. Somebody, somewhere, said, go away. I'm surmising that someone, or Certain people also said, and don't tell anybody we told you to go away. If anybody in this room would like to see the 34-page proposal, Mr. Butros is mentioned in there. He's the CEO of excellent Metro Health System, by the way. I'll be glad to give it to you. My email address, whatever you want, I'll be glad to give anybody in this room that 34-page proposal from Metro Health System to operate full-service Lakewood Hospital at a, at a profit. Furthermore, on the subject of finances, even certain Cleveland Clinic people get up there and say, Lakewood Hospital was losing money. 
SBS. Lakewood Hospital had an extremely positive cash flow, even with Cleveland Clinic gouging the heck out of Lakewood Hospital with administrative fees. Furthermore, there's been way too many inaccuracies by certain people in this room. Right now, there are full-service animal hospitals in Lakewood, but not at this time a full-service human hospital in Lakewood. Let's get real. This is dangerous. Bruce Harris' wife, Marjorie, wonderful person, had a full-blown stroke. Seven-minute drive to Lakewood Hospital, which had a stroke unit, And because Full Service Lakewood Hospital was dangerously closed, she had to go to Fairview in a bumpy, dangerous ambulance ride and then get helicoptered over to Cleveland Clinic on the east side. She could have been treated in 10 or 15 minutes if there was a Full Service Lakewood Hospital that was making a profit, by the way, but instead it was four hours later that this full-blown stroke was treated. All because Full Service Lakewood Hospital was dangerously closed. Thank you. Thanks. I'd say that that mic is definitely working now. Uh, our next speaker signed up is Tom Einhaus. Uh, good evening. My name is Tom Einhaus. I live at 1064 Sylvan. Um, I'm here to basically speak about the process, and I also want to say that I've been up for 36 hours and have had about four hours of sleep. Flew back from China yesterday, so if I'm a little off, I apologize. Um, so first of all, I want to talk a little bit about my credentials and why I was asked to be on the panel. Um, I first served on the Board of Zoning Appeals at the appointment of City Council for seven years. That was an incompleted uh, one year and then a six year term. And then, um, then Mayor George uh, appointed me to the Planning Commission and I served a full term there. Um, on both of those commissions, I also served as chair. And I'm on my second term uh, with the school board. So that's my city involvement. It's about uh, 19 years of, of uh, community service. Um, I've also, I also work at Playhouse Square, where I've been for 37 years, and I've put about $200 million worth of work in place at Playhouse Square, and we have to be very careful with our money and use it wisely. I, I think, Tracy, you know all about that. Um, so it was uh, because of my uh, professional background and my civic background that I was asked to be on this committee. Um, my work on this committee involved other uh, people in the community with similar experience in development. Um, so it was a very well-rounded committee and we had very good uh, counsel from Tracy Nichols, who I um, sits here. Uh, Tracy um, was the economic development director for the city of Cleveland and has seen much bigger and more complicated projects throughout her career and she is very well regarded. I can also say that um, in, in our uh, deliberations, um, Tracy also made a comment that we have a planning commission or a planning department rather that uh, is really the envy of any planning department in the country. So it was based on good counsel. It was based on interviews with, um, I think we started off with eight and then we shortlisted it to three. And I can tell you when we went through the shortlisting, we were looking very carefully at the economics of these deals. And some of the economics of these deals, well, I can tell you with the exception of the one we selected, the economics of these deals would have required this community to put in extraordinary amounts of money. Um, the amount of money that's being put in is not uncommon for a community to invest in a development and get a return that we're getting. I can tell you that none of the others were gonna provide us anything like that. So we had a very professional process we had a very exhaustive process. It went on for well over a year. Went into significant detail. Um, we also had good counsel from, uh, I think, was it Baker? Um, Thompson, I'm sorry, Thompson Hines. Lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. I apologize, I didn't see you over there. 
Um, so it's, it's, I don't think the, the uh, process is, is a questionable process or a rushed process or a thoughtful process. In fact, I think it was an extremely thoughtful process. I can also say at no time did anyone, anyone try to influence my opinion on this project. Um, I might say that the developers tried to influence my opinion because that was their job to get up in front of us and do their best job of selling. But I can tell you that at the end of the day, I'm very comfortable that we made the absolute right decision, led by a very professional planning department and with a very, very well-heeled uh, committee and panel. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker signed up is Sean McDermott. Good evening, Council. Again, thanks for your service. Uh, Sean McDermott, 1490 Arthur Avenue, Lakewood. Uh, it's hard to follow Tom uh, because he does such an eloquent and nearly perfect job, but I'd like to echo a lot of what he said. Uh, first, a little bit about my credentials. I uh, spent more than 15 years in the planning, engineering, uh, real estate development, and construction industries, um, overseeing more than $150 million worth of projects, and a really uh, was humbled to be asked to serve on the selection committee. Uh, to be able to see the work that your administration and specifically planning and development has done uh, is, is really enlightening and gives me as a resident a lot of confidence about the process and about the, the final selection. Uh, the, the, the way that staff was able to go about a first class process, a detailed process, dotting every I, crossing every T, a diligent process, and an open process. You know, I've got my 10-year-old here tonight who I don't know why he wants to go to a council meeting, but he wants to go to a council meeting to see a civic process. And you know, yes, there are two sides of this. And you know, that's unfortunate, but I think a few years from now when we look back and understand the decisions, the process that we went through and the history that's made, we're all gonna be in a good place. So when it comes to the term sheet, the terms speak for themselves. I think they are very positive, and I think that they are fair to both parties, fair to Lakewood, uh, fair to the city, fair to the residents, fair to the developer. Uh, on the developer's uh, standpoint, I think we have a developer who is eager, who wants to serve, who wants to deliver a first-class project to the city of Lakewood, who has equity, and who wants to build a portfolio. This is not a developer who's looking to build and flip and leave. They want to be here for the long term, and that makes a big difference. So again, kudos to the staff, and I hope that the council moves this forward and look forward to seeing what Carnegie can do. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Jay Carson. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Mr. President, members of council. Jay Carson, 13938 Lake Avenue. I'm here uh, because we have an outstanding opportunity in front of us with this potential development. I'm excited about it as a taxpayer. I'm excited about it as a resident. This is, this is a possibility that most, I would say any other inner ring suburb would dream of. Have five and a half acres of new construction in a build out city. I have followed this issue for some time. I've been to not all the council meetings, <laughs> but, but enough of them. Um, this has worked its way through the courts. It's worked its way through the ballot box in several iterations. And the city, it seemed, came to a decision. Uh, the events regarding the uh, temporary restraining order, um, again, it would be inappropriate for me to comment or speculate on what the court's thinking. Uh, but I want to tell council what I'm thinking, and that is now is not the time to go wobbly. This is an outstanding project, and I'm, I'm going to uh, echo something that, that Mr. Delzell said, which is probably surprised a lot of people. There are details to be worked out. Is it a perfect? No. Uh, but I don't want to see uh, this opportunity thrown away uh, because we listen to the voices of those who want it stopped out of spite. So uh, that's my message to council. Uh, don't go wobbly. It's important to know the court uh, did not prevent council from continuing to deliberate, from voting on this, and from moving forward. 
Uh, and I hope, and I think many other residents and they not, may not be here tonight, but it's the silent majority that spoke in these last two elections, three elections, um, that will insist that uh, this, this move forward. And I, I, I uh, respectfully ask council to, to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Pam Watula. Pamela Tula, 11813 Clifton Boulevard, did not plan to speak today, but upon hearing some of the comments made, um, I felt I had to stand up. Um, I'm just going to go through, uh, I was surprised by the amount of attention paid to uh, the uh, temporary restraining order. I thought we were here to talk about the actual ordinance. Um, the comment was made that the citizens voted multiple times to close Lakewood Hospital. And that is true, a couple times. But my contention, and it has been proven, was that the citizens voted, their voting was not based on facts because city council and this administration hid the facts behind their decisions for years. We have proof of that because the city has not complied with the state of Ohio's requirement that the city of Lakewood turn over all public records requested concerning the decanting and closing of Lakewood Hospital. If there was nothing to hide, those records would have been provided and they would not be severely redacted. The small percentage of records provided support, save Lakewood Hospital Group's contention, that facts were distorted and or withheld from the public. The public did not have the full story from the city of Lakewood. And I believe had they had all of the public records, had they had the full facts, the real story, that they would have voted otherwise. And 50,000 people would still have a hospital. The smaller hospital in Avon is servicing 18,000 people, et cetera. One Lakewood place, who are the uh, property and the tenants for office space and businesses, retail, that are actually interested in this site? We have a history in this town. Look around. The businesses open and close. We're having a hard time keeping retail. Even the bars and restaurants are not doing that well. We have so many of them. Retail is... Um, dying. I'd like to know, New York Life had 330 employees, downtown Lakewood, nice company. I have friends who work there. Not one peep from this administration about them leaving. You had to find out some other way. Not one effort to keep those 330 jobs, professional jobs, in Lakewood. No offering of, listen, we're going to build this wonderful place. You already knew that you were going to do this. Not one mention of a viable business that actually wants Class A office space in Lakewood. I'd like to know that why would Lakewood replace a hospital, 1,600 jobs plus the 330, with retail, a dying industry. We already know that it's a dying industry. It provides mostly minimum wage jobs. And as to the cost to maintain or caring for this property, we're already turning over 5.7 acres of prime downtown land for one buck or nothing. What is it worth? That still seems to be up for debate. Is it 20 million? There's a, uh, some experts say more. Has there really been a, a, a valid appraisal done on that property? I don't know that for sure, and I don't think it has been. Plus, we're talking over $7 million to uh, tear it down for Carnegie. The care and cost should be partially known already. The building has been empty, or most of it, for a period of time. So even if you have not maintained it, there should be some, we should have some idea already. That should already be out there. 
we need to compare the small cost of maintaining that property ourselves based on what we are giving away to one entity. I'd like to ask, and I've asked this before, why would we align ourselves, and it's nothing against Carnegie in particular, why would we align ourselves with a consultant for Carnegie, Mr. Fitzgerald, who has shown us that his concern has not been about the residents on a city level, on a county level, on a, on a state level, when he refused to back off as the Democratic candidate for governor. When he Thank you. All right. Vote no uh, against, have a please. Nice night. Please Thank take you. a. That's it. I'm Our done. next speaker is Coletta Graham. Shucks. She's the line before me. Okay, this, would you like to speak now? There's, there's two people left to speak, Coletta Graham and Tara Peppard. All right, fine. I just didn't want to, you know, slight her. <sighs> Hello, everyone. I'm Coletta Graham, 1286 Chase Avenue. Uh, before I talk about the hospital, I want to talk quickly uh, about a week ago Saturday when 10 cars were broken into. I'm sorry, this isn't public comment. This is the docket sign-in. We, we do need to keep our comments to the, the one docket item that we have tonight. Thanks. You're the same as usual, Mr. O'Leary. Okay, I'm, I want to ask a clear-cut question. Isn't it a fact that we were going to include the front of the old hospital this historical building, which is over 100 years old, we were going to incorporate it in the new project. And I looked at the picture that they put out, and it's nowhere to be found. Have you decided not to do this? Director Sylvester, Mayor, um, I, I think there are a few people who can jump in on this, but. The goal was to honor the historical presence of the architecture. Uh, if, if in a perfect world we could have incorporated it, uh, <laughs> it would have been uh, an interesting outcome. It was never surely intended or promised that it would be preserved. Uh, the uh, elements of the architectural design, which are yet to be determined through the architectural board of view process, are, uh, are, are part of the conversation we'd like to have to reflect on it. The, uh, I think the piece that we probably as a community connect to the most is the curved corner yes. and the sandstone and how that might reemerge in some form or another in a design uh, is yet to be determined. But there was never a promise or a guarantee that the building would be reused. Bryce, do you have anything more to add to that? No, that, that's, that puts it well, Mayor. But the, the fact is, is that this is a historical building. Why, where, where is the, uh, um, <coughs> Oh, I'm so aggravated about this whole situation. Where's the historical society? They went to bat and saved that Curtis building, which in my opinion is a piece of garbage, which has sat empty for I can't tell you how many years, not alone the storefronts, the upstairs that were the rental properties. It's an abandoned building. The building next to it, where the Christian Life Center had their people come in and out. That's sitting empty. Well, nothing's being done about that. I can't understand why you would not want to try to s at least save that small portion. We're not talking about saving the entire building. We're just talking about the archway. I mean, the city of Lakewood is, the majority of the buildings are in homes, are from era, it's not modern. And. I just, there's, I mean, the building that's up there right now that they're just about finished, you, you better put sunglasses on when you drive by if the sun's out there. Between the chrome and the glass, you're blinded driving down Detroit Avenue. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, I'm sorry. <coughs> Pardon me. I, as well, the mayor knows, some of you that were on council for all these years, I have continually brought up of why isn't there any rental being done in that Curtis building? No, 
no expression whatsoever. It's just sat there. Now, all of a sudden, we want to save the Curtis Building. And where is that society that's supposed to be going to bat for us? I, I don't know. You know, I'll end this by saying this, Mayor Summers. The city of Lakewood has always been known as the city of homes, correct? I want you to change it. Make it be the city of what? I'll tell you what, condominiums. Any space that's in the city anymore, up goes the condominium. The Sloan area, they're all the way out to the curb. I, it, it's every inch of space. I don't know. I, I feel bad because I love Lakewood, and I really think, you know, we pay the highest taxes on the west side. We're willing to do that. I mean, you're representing the people. Not the clinic, not anyone else. You're getting paid by us. And I just think we're getting short, short hit deals. Thank you. Uh, Tara Peppard. Council President, before you begin my five minutes, um, I do believe that Mr. Dilzell had a minute and 30 seconds, and I would like to request that when I am finished with my comments that you would give those to Mr. Dilzell, because I think his points are well warranted, and I do believe that you did take about a minute and 30 seconds of his time. So when I'm finished, would you, would that, I mean, that seems fair and, and freedom of speech and comment, it is related to this issue. Mr. Dilzell's had an opportunity to speak, and if he were so inclined, he could have a second opportunity to speak, and uh, that will be suffice for this evening. So you're not going to give him the one minute and 30 seconds? I'd like you to proceed with your comments at this time. Tara Peppard, 1278 Edwards Avenue. Um, I'm here to speak to express my disappointment. I feel um, what is happening is absolutely wrong. Um, and I would like to emphasize from Ms. Mrs. Graham's point, educators' music is closing after 50 years. And sure enough, the building behind where my son takes his cello lessons, that building will be demolished in six months for condominiums. And educators' music will be closing in three weeks. And that is a supportive structure to the schools. And I do believe this is a reflection of the overall um, decisions being made by our, our city leadership. So I'm going to begin with uh, uh, addressing the temporary restraining order. I did have the pleasure um, or the honor to be present at that Court of Appeals meeting, and Judge Blackman is an admirable woman, and I finally felt justice was being heard. She really listened to us. I was very concerned at the beginning that maybe she didn't understand it, but she really took the time. Mr. DeVito did an excellent job of addressing why Judge O'Donnell may have made a early decision to dismiss that, as Mr. Anderson pointed out at the beginning of this meeting. Um, public records were withheld. Public records, which include Mr. Councilman Bullock um, trying to retract a decision as he sat on the board of LHA to decide to close our hospital. That hospital had 1,100 jobs. That hospital did so much good. Babies were born. That's not an old building. Babies were born, people that, have, that were in the grace unit. I am still failing to understand this, how this could happen. And I want to say that this is the first meeting I have been to in all the many years that I've been attending the meeting. I would like to express my gratitude to Councilman George and to Councilman Radar. This is the first time I've seen some genuine questions, some wholehearted questions. I applaud you. I applaud you because I feel justice is not being served and for Ed and the people have voted, I'm sorry, there's 50% 50, 50 50 transiency in our city. These people are not pa all paying attention. The educated and the informed are here and a lot of the educated and informed can't be here because they're busy with their families. Now, um, when you put out a fake newspaper that somehow is associated with our law director and Mr. Ed Fitzgerald, who again, I attended that mayor's ball, I was in full support I of him, but I'm telling you, that misled the people, and, and our mayor just said, oh no, the people have voted. I'm sorry, the people voted saying, oh my God, our hospital's gonna close if I vote this way. And again, $50,000 was taken out of the LHA money, $50,000 to sway the vote. That's unconscionable. And that's, a, a, that's one of the members of our Board of Education's father did that. This is wrong. It's yeah, so Please keep your comments wrong. directed at I'm, council. 
Well, I'm pointing out to you that when he's telling me that people have spoken, the people have not spoken. The people have been misled by false advertising, by greed. The gentleman that spoke here this evening, construction trades, I'm not surprised. Mr. Carson, again, there's money to be profited by anybody speaking to say, this is good for our city. This is not good for our city. I have told my children, my 16-year-olds who are not here with me tonight, I said, by golly, go into law, go into medicine, go into something where you can make a positive difference and be a man of ethics. Ethics and, and where you can sleep at night. I don't know how many of you, any of you can sleep at night. It's wrong. It is wrong. And as you move forward with a restraining order, it's like deja vu with December 15th. I remember sitting there with Councilman Madigan. She made sure we all had our voice. I'm actually shocked that you're not giving him a minute tonight. But um, this is deja vu. This is a pushed meeting when a restraining order was implemented, and it is wrong. So I am here to, to tell you um, Carnegie Development should not be getting this deal with any association with Ed Fitzgerald after understanding his doings in closing the hospital. It's wrong. And our city is at risk because of this. Remove that, that, somehow that restrictive covenant needs to be removed. If you look at Metro, Metro has just opened a hospital in Cleveland Heights, just opened a hospital in Parma. Don't tell me medicine is moving to outpatient. This is, all of this is wrong. And thank God I've got members up there who are hearing us. It is, um, it gives me hope. So I am asking you this evening, I am asking you, that judge is looking at that ruling. She's looking at the evidence that's, that was being hid by these public records that were being denied to the people by Mr. Essie. Thank God for men like Mr. Essie. Thank God for men like Mr. Kent, Mr. Graham, Dean Dilzell. These are incredible human beings seeking justice. And thank you for your thank time. Thank you. Okay. Um, that brings us to the end of our comments signed up for the docket item. Uh, as I noted, we still do have public comment to look forward to at the end of the meeting. Um, now, if we could, I'd like to get back into our substantive discussion on Ordinance 27-18. Uh, um, and I will call uh, Director Sylvester up to the podium uh, at this time to uh, lead us off onto that discussion. Um, Director Sylvester, just that you're aware as well, I do want to reserve uh, a little bit of time at the end of the meeting uh, for council to discuss its process with respect to approval um, or disapproval of the term sheet and or uh, development agreement jointly and separately. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I have the fine privilege to transition us, uh, hopefully successfully, to talking about uh, the substance of the project that's been in front of us now for a couple of weeks. Uh, as I've started the last two Mondays, I wanted to start us off again with uh, coming back to www.onelakewood.com slash downtown development. This is a catalog of the entire process that we've gone through from February of 2017 until today. You can see past presentations. Uh, you can see uh, video, you can catch up at any point in the process where you have questions. Uh, we have posted content all throughout the process to make sure that it is as transparent as possible. In addition to that, we have posted the updated One Lakewood Place FAQs, um, which have come from a, a group of questions that have come out of these deliberations, but also from citizens uh, that have asked us questions. We've utilized that document to try to communicate uh, questions that have come up, I think we're around 36 or 37 inside that document, so that is also uh, posted. Also, for members of the, the public that are here for the first time tonight, uh, we do have two presentations that we gave uh, last week, April 23rd, and the week before, April 16th, that go into great detail about a lot of questions that came up tonight. Uh, I know everyone didn't have the benefit of joining all of those meetings, but we did spend hours on end talking about what the benefits of this project are to the community, uh, and certainly last Monday talking about the return on investment and financing uh, details. Again, those are all posted to the web, um, but I just wanted to address that uh, before we get started. So. Uh, quickly, again, just on April 16th to go over uh, where we've been. We spent a lot of time talking about the deliverables and the shared vision that's articulated in the term sheet um, at the meeting on April 16th, <laughs> followed by the meeting on April 23rd where we talked about return on investment and also spent a lot of time, uh, productive time, last Monday talking about the community gathering space and, and our research 
into what's called POPs, the privately owned public spaces, uh, of which we thought was a very productive discussion last week. As structured from the beginning of this process, uh, tonight was meant to be a lot of question and answer, um, and so we've structured it. Uh, so I, I wanted to preload us with some questions that I've received independently by council members, also from other members of the public over the last couple of weeks. So I've got three or four questions that I just wanted to start with to uh, get us started. I'm then gonna turn it over to Tracy Nichols to address a couple of questions that came up last Monday, uh, follow-up items, I believe, from Councilman Raider's uh, deliberation and questioning, so we have some answers tonight for you, Councilman. Uh, and then, Mr. Chair, if we could just open it up for question and answer, I think that would be perfect. Sounds great. Thank so you. So what I wanted to start us off with is uh, a recap of uh, the public meetings, both indirectly and directly, that involved City Council over this process, dating all the way back to August of 2015, when we had a, our first community meeting, leading us up to February 16th of 2017 uh, in this very room where we did an informational meeting on the RFQ and the process. Uh, July 25th, 2017 took us to the Joint ABR and Planning Commission meeting, again right in this room, where Carnegie and uh, Casto presented in front of that body. We took a lot of public comment in that room uh, to help inform finding the best and most qualified developer for this project. You'll then see, starting in October, all of the direct council meetings that uh, uh, we conducted. Starting in October, we had three, uh, which really recapped the entire process. A few meetings in November, leading to the December 4th decision to support the exclusive negotiations with Carnegie. Uh, and then that takes us up through where we've been the last couple of meetings. I've gotten a couple questions about what the schedule is, and it came up at the front end of this meeting related to the demolition of the property. But I just wanted to put up here some major milestones. Uh, uh, we've rest referenced the master schedule a couple of times through the process. A project of this scale uh, does have way more steps than this, but I just wanted to put the major milestones up here. Uh, with the term sheet approval in May, it'll allow us to move forward with the development and use agreement in June. Um, which would allow us to begin the planning and zoning process, which I know I've, I've talked about a lot, but uh, we're anticipating that, that that's going to take between six and 10 months, talking about the use of the property. Last Monday, we spent a lot of time talking about specifically how the community uh, gathering space is gonna be incorporated into that discussion, um, but city council is a big player in that process. Uh, in fact, you will have the vote to rezone the property. Uh, also on your team will be the Architectural Board of Review and the Planning Commission that will get its independent votes on the project. A preliminary vote by the Planning Commission, a preliminary vote by the Architectural Board of Review, followed by a final vote by the Planning Commission and a final vote by the Architectural Board of Review to only come back in front of City Council for final uh, review of the plan development zoning. That's going to take us between six and 10 months to conduct. We can only get to that step if we take the step that's in front of us. In June of 2018, uh, we were planning to go out to bid for the abatement demo and site preparation. In August of 2018, the city takes over management and all holding, holding costs of the former hospital buildings and the property. As of right now, we are planning that September of this year, the hazardous materials abatement would start. That would allow us to begin the demolition of property starting in December. That would lead us to the spring of 2019 where the site preparation would start. As George mentioned, that's a very critical juncture that we're able to turn the property over and new construction beginning as early as the summer or fall of 2019. If that happens, we are looking at a fall of 2020 or a spring of 2021 where the first certificates of occupancy are issued. What you are looking at up on the screen, I would say, is a best case scenario. It's April of 2018. We have three years before we will issue certificates of occupancy. There's a lot that can take place in the marketplace over a course of three years. Certainly think through the last three years that have happened to get us to where we are today. If there are any delays during this project, with their, which there certainly may be, it could be four years before we get into certificates of occupancy. 
It's important to know that because these projects take a lot of time to curate, to then fill, to construct, and to make sure that we can fill them. And so uh, we think this ad adequately addresses the three-year timeline to get us to uh, a, a property that is starting to see tenants. Another question that we got as a follow-up to our deliberations last Monday is how do we ensure that the community gathering space will be maintained for the long term? Just as a reminder, Carnegie is required to provide the city an operations and maintenance plan specifically for the community gathering space, which is referenced in section 3C of the term sheet. And then we spent actually last week going back through our research of these privately owned public spaces in cities like New York, London, San Francisco, to see if they had separate agreements that helped to manage the expectations specifically related to maintenance uh, of privately owned public spaces. And most of these cities use their zoning codes and their planning departments to help regulate these spaces over time. There's usually not separate development and use agreements. Most of them are using their uh, R chapter 11, their zoning codes to help regulate uh, these spaces, which is the approach that we've taken and uh, we'd like to pursue. There's a link in here of an example code language uh, from San Francisco. Uh, we will publish this at onelakewood.com uh, and that's just an example of how one city does it. Again, I wanted to bring up the three keys uh, to success, uh, again, for this project, but also in all of our research uh, in those cities. These three things came up in every single scenario. The, pro the community space needs to be well designed, it needs to be well constructed. You need to have an operations and maintenance plan in place before you lay a brick in the ground, and the space needs to be welcoming and vibrant. If we get those three things right, we will do this space very well, which of course is the objective, let's not lose sight of that, that we think that this is one of the most critical components of the project, being at the corner of Bell and Detroit it's going to be the front door for the development. We have to get the design right. We've set it up so uh, as it's structured in the term sheet. Another question that came up, I believe it was at last Monday's meeting, is what are the estimated costs for a space like this? It's tough to estimate at this stage. Right now we're in a very preliminary design state. Uh, but we did do research at some spaces uh, in the area. We also expanded our search outside of uh, the state to try to understand what spaces like this uh, cost and came up with an estimate between 70 and about $120 per square foot, which would equate to between 2.5 and $4 million of construction costs just for the community gathering space. Another question that has come up uh, a little bit is the difference between a, a term sheet and the development and use agreement. Um, so the detailed term sheet that's in front of you explains the business terms and roles and responsibilities of the development project. The term sheet is typically the bulk of the work because it outlines all of those business terms. It sets us up to get to the next stage of the development and use agreement, but usually this is where all of the hard negotiating happens. The DNU addresses the issues covered in the term sheet in greater specificity. The DNU will be recorded against the property and govern the long-term relationship that came up uh, last Monday as well. And then finally, I've gotten some questions on what happens if it's totally different and we sign a totally different DNU agreement. Material deviations away from the term sheet would come back to city council. One, it is absolutely not the intent for the administration to move forward like that, but because we got the question, we, we want to answer it, uh, and it's that if there are deviations away from the term sheet as it's structured in front of you, then it would come back. Mr. Chair, those are the, the five or six questions I wanted to address. Uh, I do want to turn the mic over to Tracy to address a couple of uh, items she had done, uh, and then we can open it up for Q&A. Thank you. <clears throat> Ms. Nichols. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. The uh, there were three questions that were addressed to me that I did the research to um, come back with an answer for City Council. 
The first was, show me an example of a grant not being included in ROI calculation. I went back and looked at both the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County, and in all cases where they do track a return on investment, and especially in regards to Brownfields redevelopment, which is a similar, that's generally where you have a pass through grant that's made available for specific remediation costs. They do not count that as part of the return on the investment for that body. Um, because that entity did not originate those funds, were not from their particular budget. Um, I did try to look at a few other suburban communities. However, I couldn't find any documentation of a return on investment analysis that's being done in cases where they have received funds, uh, such as um, Shops at Parma or a couple of projects in Euclid that I looked at. I couldn't find a return on investment analysis, but both the county and city routinely do that and do not include any pass-through funds or grant funds when they do an analysis. Question two was, what are the added levels of complexity with financing the project if the community gathering space was publicly owned? So in this case, what I, uh, as I thought about this, and my, um, for those in, who may be in the audience, um, I have 32 years of experience. Uh, predominant amount of that was in community and economic development with my last nine years at the city of Cleveland doing over 900 projects. So I believe what the difficulty here would be is that potential tenants could have concerns. So if you're going out and you're in a very competitive leasing market, as I would say we have in today's day, then those individuals may have concerns that if the landlord owned the plaza, that they have a relationship with that landlord, they have rent, they can withhold their rent, they have remedies, if they felt the plaza was not being maintained, but they may believe they don't have a similar relationship with the city and there may be concerns that it may not be uh, maintained in the way that they feel is appropriate because that is the front door for their um, clients, their customers, et cetera. So I felt that would be the biggest detriment to it being um, not owned by, um, by the, the developer. Um, that being said, there are obviously a number of ways to have agreements that the city would be able to um, have influence. And, um, and then that gets to question number three. Are there any additional costs associated with the structure whereby the city did not own the property, but um, the private entity did. Oh, excuse me. If there are any additional costs associated with the structure where the city did own the the, um, the plaza area, and in that case, um, I did some research, and um, the biggest example for that is the flats. And in the flats project, we ran into a lot of different issues. For example, the pavers um, are permeable there. And you couldn't use a traditional snowplow blade or snowblower, so there was actually a, a special machine that has brushes that had to be purchased and, and owned. Um, uh, there are special events that require additional security and cleanup. Um, and so if it had been city owned and managed, then um, that additional security and cleanup would be the responsibility of the city. And by the way, that would generate a lot of overtime for city staff since many of these events go on after normal hours for those types of employees. And in many cases, unions um, may not authorize non-city labor to be used to do those tasks, and therefore they would be sub, uh, subject to receiving overtime based on the, what their contract might stay. And um, so those were some of the things that I could think of that would Ill indicate that um, if the city did own the structure, there could be a substantial number of additional costs that um, may not be readily apparent, um, but those are some of the things that we had to go through when we were looking at how the flats project would be owned and operated. Um, so those were the three questions, and um, those were the answers that I have for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Rader. There we go. Thank you. I really appreciate the work you put into the questions, Bryce uh, and, and Tracy. Thank you so much for, for answering those. Um, but you, would you say also that, I mean, if the, the public space were to remain actually public, 
Um, are we saying that we would then more than likely be responsible for developing that space and, and the developer wouldn't help in, in those costs and that would also be an additional cost to keeping that space public? Is that, would that be, I don't know, just throwing that out there. I, wanna, I, I just want to get a sense in my head about the, the whole picture here, what it would actually cost to keep it public and have it sort of be still part of this project if the project, you know, of course, gets approved. Sure. So, uh, George, I'll start us off, and then I'll turn it over to you to, to talk through maybe some costs that you see as associated with the space um, all in. I think it might help for you to talk through everything that's involved in delivering what we see up on the screen. So uh, it's a great question, Councilman. I, I, the short answer is yes. I mean, I, um, we haven't really in, envisioned that structure, but I think uh, if the city were to own it, uh, we're on it for the all the construction costs related to building it out, which I brought up earlier. Uh, we are in it for full maintenance, um, again, of achieving a first-class uh, community space, which, remember, just long-term requirements of cities is minimum code, not maximum code. So uh, people in our shoes uh, 10 years from now have to meet minimum standards, not maximum standards. And the third would be programming of the space. So I would say those are the three legs of the stool related to, to cost. Um, and then just overall liability and insurance of, of managing the space. George, I'll turn it over to you to, to talk through how you guys are thinking about it too. Thanks, Bryce. Um, to address further, the um, plaza itself was initially conceived and designed with the intent that all of its components um, are integrated, managed, and operated in concert and in union, unison with each other. Um, this requires a, a comprehensive single source of responsibility to try and acknowledge and integrate all the needs of the various parties that are involved with the project that ultimately could be in conflict with each other. To introduce or to have the city uh, be involved with uh, owning that and in this instance developing it would entail us understanding and having a crystal ball on every aspect of what those potential conflicts could be and issues associated with it. But more importantly, the costs would uh, then involve all the infrastructure that would be necessary to try and service the project. It could be underground uh, from the point of view of utilities. Uh, of, it, of every kind and how it would need to service the project, in addition to obviously the actual hard costs above ground that would be associated with it. And then again, the cost, as, as Bryce was saying, maintaining it and operating it in a manner that is consistent with the obligations that we would be bound by with our respective leases and other relationships that we have for the project. So when you're dealing with all those kind of complexities, it, the cost while we can probably identify hard costs that are associated with it, the ongoing maintenance and operation of it as well is one that's very, very difficult to perceive, but it's, it would be very, very uh, time consuming and, uh, and very, very expensive to make sure that that, ac that is accomplished. Thank you. Uh, we have Ms. Nichols and then uh, Councilman Litton has a question uh, following on. Um, Mr. Chairman, if I can make a comment. Um, the other thing I want to point out to you, to City Council, is that um, frequently when the city goes out to bid and goes through their process, it can be a much longer process than when a developer is including the development and the construction as part of an overall larger construction project. And in addition, the cost when bid separately as compared to when a developer can include it as part of a construction project can, can drive up the cost. So if the city was trying to work around the construction there and trying to get that bid out separately. It could both delay the plaza development. In addition, it could run the cost up even higher as, develop, as any construction company that might come in would have concerns working around the other project. So I just want to bring that to your attention. And we ran into that as we talk about the, the flats, public square, any number of larger scale projects at the city of Cleveland. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Litton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Director Sylvester uh, and Ms. Nichols, thank you for all your answers to questions on this public space. I know I've asked a lot, and I know my colleagues have as well. Uh, forgive me if this has already been covered at some point, but 
um, in a private space for public use, is that space still fully taxable uh, uh, for property tax purposes? And perhaps that's a question for Director Pei. Uh, I, I assume so, being that it's private, privately owned. You, you may have stumped us, Councilman Litton. Uh, Tracy, I don't know if you, I, I can just say to you that that's something that needs a legal determination. We don't but know what the county will do the, or whatever. It's always based on the use, mm -hmm. and so it would be up to the county to determine if they felt the use was predominantly public or predominantly private in this case, and so that would be something that the county would have to look at, and they'd have to look at a variety of things to determine who used it more frequently, et cetera, and it probably is not going to be an easy thing to, to establish, but it is a question that always comes up. Okay, and and then I, I suppose we can at least guarantee that if it is purely city owned, it is certainly not eligible for it to be taxed. Again, it goes by use, not necessarily by ownership. Okay. Um, a classic example is the Huntington Park garage. It was a county garage, but the because it, uh, they charge money there, it is it is not a um, tax exempt use. You know, I think it might be important to point out that as an amenity, the plaza is going to enhance the value of the project. If the project's value is enhanced, so are the taxes. Sure. And so there's a distinction, I think, that needs to be made in that regard because it truly is an amenity that uh, we're going to be uh, utilizing in our efforts to market the property, which will in turn uh, demand higher or, or command higher rents. And ultimately, that goes to the bottom line of what this project is worth which equates directly to tax dollars that benefit the city. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councilwoman George. Thank you, Mr. President. I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about, there's a section here on page 10 regarding the building trades. Um, has there been any discussion to, to possibly talk and do and enter into a project labor agreement? Has that been discussed at all? Uh, that has not been specifically discussed to date, but as you know, we are making a commitment um, to uh, retain the uh, union trades uh, in our, our, our commitment to have and retain Turner Construction as the general contractor. Okay. I think it's worth reminding ourselves that uh, the building trades are also putting cash into this deal. That's no small thing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, there's huge elements of risk in a deal like this. It gets to the question of tenancy, who will be there, we don't know all those answers. So there, at this moment in time, there's enormous risk. And who bears that risk? And uh, it's important to recognize that the building trades are going to be partners in bearing that risk. That's no small thing. They would not take that on if they did not feel that they had an advantage for, their, for the union members and the long-term interest that uh, the project will yield. OK. Thank you. Yeah, I just want to make sure we're, um, you know, uh, we're working with the trades, and we're, we're making sure that we're uh, utilizing union labor in the project. So thank you. Thank you. And I would um, add as well that for, for my part, um, I think as I've uh, mentioned before, that uh, as the panel, the citizen panel, was reviewing the various developers, um, it was really uh, a, a standout difference maker uh, that Carnegie was uh, prepared to so closely partner with um, our friends at the building trades. Uh, to make sure that we are able to deliver um, some of those good union jobs uh, to the site here in Lakewood. Um, other questions from council? Yes, President. Uh, Vice President Anderson. Yeah, just real quick, thank you very much. Uh, Director Sylvester, in my mind's eye, half a square acre of land for our conversations from last week is basically twice as much green space that we currently have at just it's not that we use the current space that's green in front of the, the hospital now. It's green space, like we're talking about, for his public space. But it's it's literally twice that size. That's correct. That, that's it. That's just the minimum. Estimated costs of hardscaping half a square acre of land. Um, just just hardscape or to a design that's. Well, to a design similar to what's being replicated or at least uh, rendered here before us tonight. Yeah, I would, um, I would use the same uh, estimates on square footage here, so between $70 and 
twenty dollars per square foot um, well now there's a calculator we're asking for a half acre is that right yes minimum okay so just roughly half an acre is about 1.7 million at 70 bucks a foot to 2.8 million at 120 bucks a foot but remember that the development calls for 35,000 square feet there is a minimum of a half an acre in the term sheet, right. but the developer is uh, working on executing at 35,000 feet. So as we're talking about different iterations of how we want to uh, legally describe or keep or the, the, the acronym that you use, the POPS, we're talking about millions of dollars of public investment if we wanted to revert this and keep this as, as public space, not as privately owned public space. Correct. And that's not to include the, the, the hour every day or hours every day of maintenance for 365 days for between now and you know, 50 years from now at a minimum. So we're Correct. talking about a pretty sizable investment that we would need to make as a city if we choose an alternative path to this particular half, half of acre. Yeah. And I mean, I... I would also reiterate some of George's comments. I mean, there's great benefit, and as I've stated before, to having the community gathering space be at the corner of Bell and Detroit, which is arguably the most expensive real estate on this entire project. The other corner, by the way, which is the most expensive corner, is the historic Curtis block. So we have the historic Curtis block and the community gathering space anchoring this project. It's all tied to the entire project. Right and the delivery of everything that's been put in front of us. Uh, we're not getting a public space buried in the center of the site, as was another proposal. We're not getting a, a, a token green space to the south of this site. We are getting the corner of Bell and Detroit as a community gathering space. And because it's that way, we're, we have to structure it the way that it is in the term sheet in order to deliver the entire project. I appreciate your, uh, your quick math there. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. Other comments from council, or questions, I should say? Yes, uh, Councilman Bullock. Thanks, Mr. President. Uh, and um, turning to the substance, um, I want to talk about the uh, public plaza portion uh, first, or the publicly, the, the proposed privately owned publicly accessible space first. We're going to talk more later about other aspects, I suppose. But the, um, uh, as somebody, I've been uh, one of those leading uh, uh, kind of a hard line of questioning about about this feature of the project because I think it's so central to a the project, b the community, and c the public's expectation uh, for the heart of our downtown. I mean, this would be our public square uh, in use and in. Um, in, in the public imagine, in pu the public imagination, frankly, it might even become a visual icon of the community, or one of the major ones, along with the Lakewood Park and the Solstice Steps. So it's it's there's a lot riding on it. Um, um, now I've had the chance to do a lot of deliberation uh, and consultation in the last since we met a week ago, and and I've I've come a long ways in my my own thinking and understanding here, and and actually some of the uh, new FAQ answers, I'm reading closely here, and, and um, I want to zero in on two aspects. Uh, one of the questions says, how can we be sure, and Bryce, I think this is up live on the website now too, right? Or yeah. will be soon? It'll be tomorrow morning. Okay. It's not up there now. So uh, for the benefit of everybody at the meeting and or listening at home, um, uh, the planning director shared with council members three or four new Q&A answers, and I'm referring to that, and that's going to be public. So one question is, how can we be sure the plaza will be open for public use for decades to come and not impacted by ownership changes? Um, uh, and that is, the, the summary would be that it will go through the planned development rezoning process, which is already on Lakewood law books, and that will allow the city to have a voice in determining the use of the property and specifically how we can establish how it will be used. That's an effective way to determine size, placement, and use 
of the gathering space and any major modifications would require council, the Planning Commission and Architecture Board of Review and Approval. And then an example is, what if you wanted to build a skyscraper on that plaza, could you do it? And the answer is no, not without approval. A better question than what if you wanted to build a skyscraper to my mind would be what if there was a significant uh, change in proposed use by the owner, in this case it would be Carnegie or whatever entity after development and construction, um, assume, presumably operated by Carnegie or, or your affiliate. What if in 15 years uh, you had a change in vision and uh, there was a proposal to significantly restrict public access? Is the answer to that question that that would also go through our uh, planned redevelopment, planned development rezoning process? Could we specify when we get to that stage conditions of use um, as much as conditions of design? Yes. Okay. So that there is a major uh, help and tool, I think, to address the community interest. Um, so thank you for clarifying. The other major thing uh, in your summary is, um, there's another question that says, why not lease the community gathering space? And part of the answer, uh, it's a side point or a sub point, but I think it, it answers a key question for me, is that uh, Class A office tenants have high expectations that the space would be constructed, programmed, and maintained in a first class manner. So in this case, I think as I'm educating myself, because I am not a design or development professional, I'm not an attorney, I'm not a doctor, I don't play any of those things on TV, I'm just a citizen, um, who comes at this with the perspective of a high expectation user um, that we have an alignment or a very significant alignment between the public user and the private user, I think here it's accurate to say, because somebody who's going to be paying Class A office tenant rates and bought what they understand to be a well-maintained plaza with shopping and dining and maybe even some entertainment uh, every so often, um, they're going to expect a clean, vibrant, usable, dynamic, thriving space where they can meet their neighbors and perhaps even the community. Um, would would uh, the folks in the proposal in, in the development team agree? Uh, am I barking up the right tree or, or do you have a different view? No, that's, I think you're, you're going in the right direction with that. Okay, so if we were, if you were proposing an industrial use, that would be a different story. You might need a trash truck turnaround space here. If you're proposing a residential use, you might want a private square. That's probably a better example. You might want a private green primarily for the use of your uh, residential tenants. But in this case, we have a public area facing the, 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 literally the crossroads of our downtown designed for public plaza use. It's going to be a high quality space managed in a high quality manner in alignment with the high quality rates you'll be charging and therefore um, we can reasonably anticipate high quality when it comes to the public use. That's correct, but you also must keep in mind that we're going to have obligations. It's not just expectations, but it's obligations that we'll bind ourselves legally to these tenants that we have to perform. And therefore, it's important and critical that we have the control to do so. Okay. And that's something that, again, uh, you know, with ownership uh, allows us that uh, authority and also that flexibility to address exactly what those so needs. You'll are. have some private to private covenants and, and, and obligations, and Absolutely. that'll be contractually enforceable. Yep. Uh, and in, in, in addition to that, we may layer on a community uh, use, I don't know what the term would be, agreement or uh, guidelines or, 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 or something uh, through our zoning process. I know we do envision, we've got the Lakewood Alive uh, director here. Let me just give a plug for Lakewood Alive. I think they've done, on a shoestring budget, a hugely valuable job of essentially marketing the community, staging 
the downtown and getting all of us to basically make a public plaza out of Detroit Avenue several times a year by blocking it off and programming it with vendors and all kinds of things. That's been helpful and valuable and important. And so uh, I think we've said before, but I'm just uh, clarifying for the record that uh, we would envision access to this public plaza for those several times a year public um, street festivals, for lack of a better term, to, to incorporate this footprint too. Uh, now that would be specific times uh, that would be scheduled in advance. But that was, uh, I think, I think, are we on the same page on that one? Yes, absolutely. We've talked about uh, identifying specific dates during the year. Um, right now, I think we've got approximately 15 of those that we're looking at. But uh, we would want to uh, coordinate and align ourselves and program with uh, Lakewood Alive and all the members, uh, uh, maybe the Chamber of Commerce and other members of the community that we can sit and talk about how that space would be used. I think it's important to emphasize again that it is the front door to the project. Um, accessibility and bringing people into the plaza is what we need. I mean, that there's frankly going to be a, a spin-off associated with that. In fact, I, I'm certain our tenants and our office uh, dwellers are going to be very, very concerned and wanting to see that kind of inter interaction because, uh, you know, ultimately there's a spinoff that's associated with that potentially business-wise as for them as well. Uh, whether it's them wanting to go into the, the retailer or the service tenant, the retail service tenant or the restaurant or towards the office or be even able to go out and just sit around and relax in, in an open space at lunchtime for our office. So. Certainly, yeah, and you have retail um, envisioned and, in fact, minimums required here. So the retail tenants would have a direct interest in, in having a successful and welcoming space for uh, people and potential customers to join you. So um, all of that is to say that um, I, um, I'm uh, satisfied at this stage that we could be successful in the ownership structure proposed by the term sheet and the, the negotiators that represent the city and the and and in, in interacting with Carnegie, um, and the the primary function that this pro this proposed project is supposed to fulfill in my mind is to revitalize the downtown and grow the tax base. And what we've heard, I, I'm really talking to my council colleagues and and and, I, and the public as well, is that to help the pro developer help the city. Uh, some of these key ownership features have been negotiated in the term sheet and recommended to council. And the, the, the major uh, question that I had about the whole list was this public plaza ownership question. And I'm, I'm happy to, um, I'm, I'm comfortable with a recommendation having had the chance to consult and confer and actually even see some potential renderings of, of, of what may come. The design is, uh, there's a lot of work to do ahead of us in the 10 or 12 months ahead of us to get into the fine details of, of the design, and that's going to be very, very important. Um, but we'll have a chance to, to work on that in the, in the um, months ahead. So what I'm essentially saying is that um, uh, in, in the whole, I'm uh, supportive of the term sheet and is proposed. I reserve the right to make additional questions and um, or ask additional questions and uh, look for refinements before a uh, final vote. But but that's the major question I had raised from the beginning, and I'm satisfied. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I do want to uh, be respectful of everyone's time here tonight, and we do have public comment to get to as well. So I think that uh, this might be a good time. Um, following on to Councilman Bullock's comment for us to talk a little bit about uh, timing um, for our deliberations and, and that process. Um, since there have been uh, a couple council members um, here tonight, certainly, and over the course of the past few weeks who have been, um, either have articulated so far that they see themselves getting more comfortable uh, with the term sheet uh, over the passage of these few weeks and, and the answers to these additional questions, uh, as well as uh, some council members who have indicated that they certainly could see themselves being at that point soon. So what I want to do um, now is uh, essentially, as was mentioned a couple of meetings ago, with respect to the schedule and some of the concerns, as we know there's um, 
an opportunity to market this project that's coming up, uh, I believe, May 20th. Um, and so it was Council's desire, if possible, um, and uh, practical uh, under the circumstances to uh, conclude deliberations prior to then on the term sheet um, so that we might be in the best position possible to um, trumpet the good things that are happening in Lakewood and the potential uh, that this project has for the redevelopment of our downtown. Uh, on that note, I would feel comfortable personally uh, moving forward with a vote on this term sheet uh, next Monday. But I, I know that uh, Vice President Anderson as well has had a conversation with Law Director Butler, um, I believe just today uh, perhaps, or, or at least uh, very recently within the last couple of days, and had a suggestion um, that he wanted to raise as well. Uh, Vice President Anderson. Thank you, Mr. President. And really the question was sort of a, um, a composite of different comments, including one of my own about you know, specifically what our potential passage of 2718 looks like going forward. And really, it just manifests in the authorization of the, of the mayor to enter into a development agreement. And what I'm looking for is for an opportunity for our experts, Ms. Nichols and our friends at Thompson Hine, to, to be able to see that final draft of the development agreement before council, before the people of Lakewood, prior to the execution of the development agreement. I think that would be very helpful. And to the point that was made earlier, uh, you know, us, us passing this potential, potential passing of the ordinance and, and authorizing moving forward with the term sheet is not carte blanche. That development agreement has to mimic the term sheet. And to the point that that can be reported back to city council that that development agreement will in fact mimic the term sheet, I think that would certainly be very helpful to me and maybe to some of my members of council, as co-members of council as well. So what I'm suggesting, Mr. President, is at the end of section two, a proposed ordinance 2718, is a comment to the following um, provided. However, that the development agreement shall be delivered to council prior to its execution by the mayor in order for council to hold at least one public hearing on its terms. I think that would certainly be beneficial to the community. I'm sure it'd be something that the administration would be more than welcome to, and I can't imagine uh, any, any objection, but um, I don't want to read people's minds. I'm not a mystic. But that's sort of the thought. Again, provided, however, that the development agreement shall be delivered to council prior to its execution by the mayor in order for council to hold at least one public hearing on its terms. So that is, is uh, also move to amend section two in that way, Mr. President. Thank you. Um, we have uh, a motion uh, now pending. I would second the motion to uh, amend the ordinance that's before us um, to uh, insert the additional text. Um, I want to open the floor um, at this time to fellow council members for their feedback, both on uh, the potential date uh, at which we could potentially move forward, as well as um, the amendment that's before us this evening. Proposed amendment, I should say. Yes, uh, Councilman Rader. Yeah, with this, uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson and Mr. Bullock. Uh, excuse me, Mr. O'Leary. Uh, would the public hearing culminate in a vote uh, on the uh, agreement, or would you just say, which is this envisions, or? I would defer to the law director for the strict interpretation, but I would say, just based on a plain reading, no. Okay. I would agree with that. President. Yes, Vice President Anderson. I believe it's the intention of Ordinance 2718 and the term sheet. That's what gives the authorization of the mayor to move forward. Um, you know, but insofar as the development agreement mimicking or not mimicking the term sheet, that's when council can take steps to, uh, you know, as Director Sylvester mentioned earlier, to have the development agreement sort of not take place and have the, the term sheet come back to City Council. It needs to mimic. I have no uh, issue with anyone suggesting that, uh, well, I'm not going to read people's minds. I just want to make sure that everyone, including the community, is aware of the actual language of the development agreement and the fact that it's going to be mimicking the term sheet prior to its execution. So our authorization as a council in voting in the proposed ordinance, which brings forward the the term sheet, that's our authorization. So that's our vote. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Oh, I'm sorry. Nope. Go ahead. Um, 
I would still like to see this come back before council before a vote, just to just for good measure. I think that's something that uh, at least the term sheet, sheet seemed to envision. And on page 10, the last paragraph, page 10 of the term sheet, it does mention this is going to come back before council for council's approval. So why is the ordinance and the term sheet kind of out of sync on that? I guess would be that kind of leads me to that that point. Sure, uh, Director Butler, do you care to address? I don't. Concern? Um, I appreciate the question, certainly, and uh, respect the question. I don't think that the ordinance and the term sheet are out of sync. I think the ordinance before you actually does approve of the mayor's entry into a development agreement that mirrors the, uh, that or that incorporates the uh, um, substantive provisions of the term sheet. So um, I think, and frankly, the ordinance uh, before you, uh, if adopted as is, uh, or even with this amendment, um, uh, it supplants any obligation to come up with another ordinance um, that council would then consider. So I don't agree that they're out of sync. Um, and and you know, I think section two resolves that. Okay, so you're saying that the, uh, thank you, um, but you're saying that the uh, term sheet on page, the page 10 where it says the council will have the ability to vote on this, is it, I mean, that, why, why is that verbiage in there, I suppose, uh, if it's being supplanted? Well, did the term sheet initially envision that council would vote on this, and then it was changed later on during the, the proposal of the ordinance? And, and if so, for what reason, I guess, is what I'm getting at. Let me speak to that. Thank you. I mean, I, I think, to be honest, it was reserving the optionality of, of different structures um, at a very early stage when that was sort of placed into the, the term sheet. So I don't think that there was any focus on are we proposing a different process going forward. So it was in our best interest to consider, you know, all the different potential approval processes that could be ultimately considered. Um, you, you, you've asked a lot of important questions about whether or not this is a customary uh, process or not. and. We did go back and take another look at that. And I, I think, as I've indicated previously, there are lots of different ways that uh, communities can you know, approve uh, development projects. So there's no one uniform method that is um, you know, used by every community. And in fact, most communities actually ultimately use a variety of methods themselves. And it depends a little bit upon the state of the negotiation of the terms, um, what kinds of public support is involved in a project, um, how quickly things need to move. Um, so I think a variety of factors you know, enter into it. Um, that said, I think you will find, generally speaking, that the process being recommended here is most consistent um, with what other communities um, do uh, on these kinds of mixed-use projects. So um, a pretty typical process, um, particularly for entering suburbs where, where invariably there is a, some degree of public engagement, is that there is some sort of term sheet or a letter of intent, um, and those terms are authorized, the, the mayor and the administration is authorized to enter into a development and use agreement consistent with those terms. Sometimes it's literally an attachment to the ordinance, like an actual term sheet or LOI. Sometimes the actual terms are usually in quite simplified terms described explicitly in the ordinance. Um, and again, that's not the only way that exists. There are lots of good ways. Um, sometimes uh, development and use agreements that have tax increment financing in it, um, that requires a specific ordinance to move forward with it, and so it's not uncommon if they're not doing separate legislation for that sometimes, and it's only incorporated in the development and use agreement. Sometimes that does go back to council. Um, you know, we have Tracy Nichols here who has a, a great degree of experience and breadth of experience in, in um, development and use agreements. So perhaps, Tracy, could you speak just a, a little bit to your experience? I generally, in the city of Cleveland, we would always uh, provide council with basically a, a a very simple term sheet of what the project was going to encompass. And um, then council would give the director of economic development, in this case, the ability to negotiate the development agreement. That being said, I could tell you how it's 
the check and balance of a process like that, because I think that's what you're getting to, Councilman Rader, if I could say through the chairman. And so what I would say is this, that once the ordinance is approved and the terms are there, then the person who has to implement it, Rice in this case, would have to work through that development agreement with this council. And it's the, the job of the law director to make sure that that says what the, what the ordinance says. So there is that check and balance to make sure that it has that. If it deviates, they have to come back and ask for an amendment. And so that's how we always handled it at the city of Cleveland is that we go through, here's the terms, we'll get that work done. The law director reviews it, approves it, makes sure it's conforming with the ordinance. So that's how we handle it. And, um, and, and that gets things done on a timely basis, but still at any point someone could take a look at it and say, oh yeah, there it is, it does comply. There, there is one aspect of this term sheet that's a little atypical. Um, which is the level of detail that you find in it. Um, it's not unheard of, um, but it really reflects our experience that projects work best if upfront, before anybody's made any sort of commitments, before people are spending lots and lots of money, um, before there are going to be disputes, you really try to work through all of the material issues. So that was really when we started upfront, we said, this is really the process that we recommend instead of uh, getting to a term sheet and then having the administration spend months and months and months working through all of the material issues, we recommend the upfront investment and in doing a detailed term sheet where you try to work through almost everything you can come up with and then there should be a really, a, a pretty abbreviated process to get to a development and use agreement and we got buy-in from Carnegie on that kind of process um, which is not, you, it's not all the time. Sometimes developers just want you to go quick, 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 quick. Um, but they saw the merit in trying to work through as much as possible. And so when Bryce, you know, called me earlier today to talk about can there be a material deviation between a term sheet that's um, been authorized for the administration to execute a development and use agreement consistent with it, I mean, the answer is clearly no. I mean, you have, this, this term sheet was designed to reflect the material terms, and if there is a material deviation from any of those terms, then that's something that, you know, we would have to come back and, and, and revisit um, with council. Um, and it's, I think, designed very intentionally to put you in a position that you certainly haven't seen everything that is going to be in the development and use agreement, but you've seen all of the material terms. So I will give you just an example since we're working on the draft. Um, you know, there's, there are logistics of some of, the, of some of the provisions here that you have to kind of work through. So there is actually a transfer of real estate that is going to happen in connection with this project. Well, the term sheet communicates in sort of a general way that there's going to be a transfer, but it doesn't include all of the kinds of, um, you know, this is what the deed is going to look and like, this is who the title company that you're going to use, this is, you know, the title insurance policy that, of the quality that they need to receive. And those are the kind of level of details. I mean, there's not going to be a material disagreement uh, between us over those things because they're very customary, but they're still, you know, they're, it's several paragraphs that have to be devoted to just working through that. That's the kind of, thing that we're, um, you know, working through, or you've asked lots of important questions around how are we going to protect that public use. Well, the development and use agreement will reference the fact that there has to be a zoning um, code that is going to protect this public use. It will also describe in detail the form of the restrictive covenant that will be placed on the property. It will attach a form of what that looks like. So it's it's not um, a deviation from it. It's really just sort of adding in the the extra detail. Um, but there should be no deviation from from the material terms here without having to come back to council. Thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions from council pertaining to uh, Councilman Anderson's amendment, or uh, do we feel comfortable? Um, having a vote now on the amendment. Again, the thought potentially being that with the amendment in place, uh, providing for an additional hearing uh, after the development use agreement has been negotiated, 
um, that potentially council would be in a position to act uh, next Monday, uh, the 7th, on the, the underlying uh, ordinance. Councilman Bullock. Thank you, Mr. President. I think it's a good proposal, uh, Councilman Anderson, and I just uh, didn't know uh, that uh, a, such a amendment was in the making, but I read it through carefully, and, and I think it's thoughtful and a good addition. And I, I do appreciate um, Councilman Rader's uh, points and actually uh, Mr. Graham's points. I'm a, a jealous for Council's authority on these matters. Uh, so um, thank you for the uh, discussion of the functions of term sheets, development and use agreements. I, I do like the idea of a consultation. Frankly, the spirit of such an amendment, if it were to pass, and even if it is not to pass, is that Council has an expectation that there's ongoing consultation throughout that we're kept in, in the loop, <clears throat> that uh, any major material issues or implementation issues uh, would be uh, consulted by the administration uh, in a good faith manner, in a transparent manner with all of us. But essentially the proposed uh, ordinance as written would, would, would view or would um, uh, place the discretion ultimately in the mayor on whether to execute a development and use agreement once the term sheet's in place. So there is that um, public check. It, it's just in the form of the mayor. Um, I, I think this is a nice uh, middle ground that uh, Councilman Anderson has proposed. Let me answer the other question you said, uh, are we ready for an imminent vote? I, I would hope that we are. Um, as uh, I'll just repeat what we said before, that the I think it's council's, in, our, in council's interest to see this project succeed or a project like it, but this is the one that we're dealing with, so that it can revitalize the downtown, grow the tax base, and do everything it's supposed to, to do for us. And we know that timing is essential. And um, in order to not rush deliberation, I can stay till 3 a.m. tonight. I'm open Friday night. I'm open Sunday night, not Saturday. I got to go to a wedding. But uh, I'm very serious. If council needs more time, let's get in the more time. But let's aim for uh, May 7 as the date of passage. And if there's a reason not to do that, uh, I'm very open to hearing the remarks from my colleagues. But if it's just a matter of us uh, having the, the space to do our jobs, which is very important, then, then let's, my, my invitation is that we we put in overtime so that we can get it done. Thanks. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Yes, the, uh, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, President Lear, sure. members of Congress. I just wanted to affirm my support of the amendment. The administration commits to do everything it can to make sure you understand exactly what's before us. Thank you. Uh, there being no additional uh, comments or questions on the proposed amendment, uh, mm -hmm. Madam Clerk. Anderson? Yes. Bullock? Yes. Bullock? Yes. Whitley? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. O'Malley? Yes. Raider. Yes. That motion passes. Uh, we have an amended version. Um, I think out of respect for everyone's uh, time, as was uh, mentioned, um, we could consider um, wrapping up our discussion for this evening and getting to, to public comment. Um, but to Councilman Bullock's point, I don't want to um, have anyone um, feel that we're giving short shrift to any of the issues here. Um, that have been raised, and I would also, again, um, provide council with a reminder that uh, members of the administration, as well as uh, our outside council experts, uh, have made themselves available to answer any and all um, questions, and I know that they've been, um, as you've seen here tonight, uh, heavily engaged in that enterprise over the past uh, few weeks as council members have um, individually delved in uh, with their own uh, questions and concerns. And I, I also just want to take a minute to commend um, my fellow council members uh, as well as members of the public and, and the uh, administration team. I think that um, we've all endeavored to really ask a lot of difficult questions throughout this process, and uh, I know that we will continue uh, to do so here in these final stages. Um, any additional uh, questions or comments from Council before we go into public comment this evening? Um, Councilman Rader and then Councilman Bullock. Uh, I'll defer to Councilman Bullock or Councilman O'Malley seem to have a question if, because I've, I've talked a lot. I don't want to, okay. Um, I have a few things I'd like, if it's possible, to read into the record. I mean, I just have a lot of questions. And I, I you know, if we're wrapping up soon, I want to make sure that the administration has enough time. And you've been great, by the way. Thank you for Bryce, particularly, for answering a lot of my questions. I call you a lot, <laughs> text you a bit. 
Um, and some of these were questions I asked actually him earlier this week, but I'd like to just read them to the record so that we could uh, maybe have a dialogue next week um, about them. So first off, I want to make sure that this project, uh, if it were to continue, is going to shoot for uh, lead certification um, and, and a high level of lead certified. I know that uh, other projects similarly have shot for like silver or emerald level lead certification. I want to make sure that, um, you know, that that's built into the, the, the term sheet or the agreement as we move forward. Um, also, Curtis Block, when we talk about the uh, ADA, the Accessibility Act, American Accessibility Act, um, I just want to make sure that, um, you know, all new construction has to meet ADA, but there are some grandfathering things that go along with um, older structures, such as the Curtis Block, and I would want to make sure that we build in that, since we're doing some major renovation in the building, maybe we should look at making sure that, that any kind of accessibility needs are met to a higher standard than that, and we don't take any of the routes of, of you know, um, uh, you know, I, well, I don't want to say shortcuts because you're within the law sometimes to, you know, not go all the way to the to new construction ADA in an older building. But I'd like to see elevators and things like that to make sure that, because um, we have a lot of uh, elderly people in that area who might be using this facility again. So I would want to make sure ADA is fully enforced and even above that in in the Curtis block. Um, also, I'd like to know a little bit about the capital stack in this, uh, of the project, just to get a little, little bit of understanding of the capital brought to the table. And we mentioned that the building's trades is bringing some of the financing, um, but, but who's really bringing the solid, you know, uh, I don't know if it's called collateral, but the, the, the money that, that is being used uh, to start the, basically that we're borrowing, they're borrowing the money against. They're managing the land is a lot of that. The land is a lot of that value. So I'd like to just have a clearer picture. That might be even be in the pro forma. We talked about that. I'd like to see that in a little more detail. Um, and I think, and the appraisal, the appraisal is coming out on the 7th, is that correct? Or I, it was mentioned, I made a note in one of my uh, notebooks to look back, it said that, that there is an appraisal. Somebody brought up in public comment that there was an actual independent appraisal um, that's being done, and then we're going to be able to see that when? Uh, through the president? Yeah, uh, by the 7th is the target, Councilman. Okay. Um, so then on that day, we'll probably be presented that before we have it, before we vote. Okay. I just wanted to get a clarification on that. So that, that's it. So thank you. I appreciate thank it. Um, Councilman Bullock. I was actually going to ask a question, which um, I don't know if it's customary, but I was going to ask my colleagues, do you have any major outstanding concerns or issues you'd like to see resolved? Um, I mean, I've spoken to the record on, on mine, but uh, I, I, I think it's helpful to know. Um, and, and I just ask you that as a colleague. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments this evening? Um, yes, Councilman O'Malley. <clears throat> just to Councilman Bullock's point, I just, um, the uh, Carnegie team and the administration and other council members uh, have been very accessible. I just want to acknowledge that. Um, this is a 12-page document. It's not exactly war and peace. I've had the chance to read through it several times. I've been to every council meeting and community meeting on this subject. I've uh, tried to be as accessible as I can be to my residents. I'm going door to door tomorrow in my ward to talk about this and um, have gotten a lot of feedback on it. And uh, I don't have any outstanding questions um, at the moment, and if there are in the coming week, I'll be sure to ask those, and we'll have an opportunity to ask more questions on the record next week as well. So, um, but I feel comfortable. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, there being no additional uh, comments or questions from council this evening, we will now uh, turn it over to public comment. We've got several folks signed up, and the first is Celia Dorsch. Ms. Dorsch. Again, thank you all uh, in the audience for your patience this evening and uh, our deliberations. Thanks. Good evening. Um, my name is Celia Dorsch. My address is 1536 Chesterland Avenue. Um, I had no intention of speaking. I just came to see what was happening. Uh, I was born in Lakewood Hospital and have lived in Lakewood all my life. We're now into the third generation of our family here in Lakewood. And I, and I just felt compelled after listening to all that was being said to urge you as a council 
um, to understand that there are lots of people who aren't here tonight who voted for this to happen. And um, I, I was shocked, to be honest, that there is that it's being held back or that there's this delay. I appreciate it. Coming here this evening was really important to me because I got to hear how strongly you're deliberating on this. Um, but I feel that there's a lot of voices that aren't being heard or, you know, I'm not a tradesperson. I don't have any special interest in this project at all other than it's gonna take Lakewood forward. And I'm just, it really needs to happen. So that's it, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker signed up is Kevin Young. Can you go into audio and ask a question? Um, I only signed up once, I didn't see something. Sure, uh, yeah, I think we did, we did take the public comment sheet um, up. Uh, I just so. have a question, it's simple. When I went to the auditorium meeting concerning this, um, Bryce and uh, uh, Sam O'Leary, were giving the presentation and they made a special point of saying that this was a high resolution portrait of what was being considered. That it did not have any basis in reality of what really was going to happen. You said that and I talked to both of you afterwards after that meeting to ask you uh, and to point out that most people probably might have missed that. Um, because uh, the other comment was made that it would be built from the ground up. Nothing had really been decided in stone. So my question is, um, when are we going to get a more accurate depiction of what's going on? And because this is what's been marketed, and this is what people in Lakewood that like this, I'm not saying I'm against any advancements, but this is what they're seeing. This is what they were shown. Are you going to have an accurate, more accurate depiction of what's going on before you vote? That's my question, because I think that's important. Thank you. Thank you. Director Sylvester, briefly. Yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, thanks for the opportunity. Um, I, I don't think those were my exact words that night. Uh, what, I, what I'm sure that I was talking about was the uh, Planning Commission and ABR process, which adds review to what's in front of us now. Uh, remember that this is part of a round two requirement for the developer to put a concept together. Uh, it's a starting point for us to begin. We are very confident in that starting point. Um, we like the design that's in front of us, but we are going to use our process that's established by way of the plan development rezoning uh, to put Lakewood's touch on this project. Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, I would even turn it over to, to George and Rustam to, to share a little bit about that too. Sure, and I, I just wanna briefly share my own thought about this process, which I, I think it's an important um, footnote that is actually kind of, should be a header uh, in some respects. And I think you and I have talked about this a lot, which is that the development process generally is a partnership. And as we embark on this partnership uh, together um, with Carnegie, uh, for this project, it's a moving target, it's dynamic, just as our city is dynamic and the markets are dynamic. And so, you know, what we are ultimately able to deliver for our citizens is what is the best product that we, that we can, that the market will support, um, and that we're, we're able to work together on. Um, and so, you know, I think it's important that when we think of these agreements, we're not, this isn't uh, a contract for road salt, uh, where the city is gonna pay X dollars and get X tons. Um, this is uh, a more um, living and breathing kind of document and, and partnership. And um, I think that the more appreciation we have for that going into this process, the better a process we can make it for everyone. Uh, Mr. Papandreas. Um completely agree with you on that. And Bryce, thank you. Uh, you know, I want to remind uh, the city that what you see before you is in response to what was a very detailed and very well done, I might add, request for a proposal um, to uh, that address certain objectives that were clearly identified by the city. And then in response to that, we gave you what we thought was our vision, our, our belief in what could be a transformational, iconic, sustainable, 
uh, a vibrant center for the city of Lakewood. It is by no means intended to be uh, a final design. Uh, it is really, um, you know, sensitive to the fact that there is a process that the city goes through uh, in any kind of approval of a project of this nature, primarily so that it can understand and, and, and hear all of the comments and needs and desires of the community and the city through its advisory board, whether it's the Planning Commission or ABR, would like to see it as a part of the project. I think that's what makes it a great opportunity for everybody involved. And it's that balance as we move forward, along with our expertise and our understanding of what the market is and what the tenant demands are going to be, that hopefully is going to make this project evolve into something that we can all very, very much identify with and approve and, and, and want. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yes. President. Councilman Bullock. I can, I can add a little bit even more detail to that answer. Ms. Petula, I think once we have the term sheet, we'll be able to get uh, clear, more clearly into those answers, and the minimums in the term sheet help give you some sense of that. So the actual tenants who sign binding agreements with the developer will help shape what building gets built, how big it is, et cetera. And we can't get to that until we have a term sheet, which is the beginning of a concrete agreement between the city and the developers, so the developer can then turn to other private companies and say, hey, we've got a real project, why don't you start signing up? So <clears throat> what we have is the outlines of detail, uh, the broad contours that will then get filled in, and the um, city uh, working with the developer We'll be able to, I think, add a lot more detail in the coming months, and then that will then go to a design, and the aesthetic cladding, as I've come to learn, will be a part of that, but the, uh, of what the Architectural Board of Review considers. But in terms of the important questions of how much office, how much retail, what kind of residential, that's going to be a lot of market negotiation that cannot start yet because the project doesn't exist unless and until there's a, there's a term sheet in place. So the gun is going to go off perhaps soon to allow us to begin to answer those questions in a more specific. That's my understanding. Thank you. Uh, our next commenter uh, is Nancy Vaughn. Good to see you. Nancy Vaughn, 14909 Clifton Boulevard. This is where I live, this is my honest address. Unlike three other people here that testified on behalf of Mr. Summers' wishes, gave false addresses for residences, or, or certainly as far as I know, false addresses for residences. Um, as far as the how to keep the POPS for the public, Rockefeller found that one very good way was to put it into the deed so that the land remains open to the public. I would consider that along the way. Uh, I think that's it. What we need still badly is a full service acute care hospital. Thank you. Our final uh, commenter signed up to speak is Captain Steve Eagert. And he uh, doesn't appear to be with us any longer this evening. Um, so that brings us to the end of our public comment signed up. Um, thank you all again very much for attending. Um, I'll note that we, uh, as discussed, will be back here uh, one week from today on Monday, April 7th, for our continued discussion, as well as the regularly scheduled meeting of Lakewood City Council. Thank you all again so much for attending. With no further business, move to adjourn. A motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion on the motion to adjourn? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? That motion passes. We are adjourned. Thank you.